the Fed is not thinking pause right now. They're thinking about inflation. They're thinking about a pre-March 8th world. If they pause, what does the market do in response to that? The biggest source of policy error right now is for the Fed to worry about what's happening to a couple of bad banks. We should have some short-term volatility, probably slower economic growth, bad news from the Fed. I think we're in this environment for some time. There's going to be opportunities. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Ramitz, and Tom Keen. It is a Monday before a jobs report, but more than that, it is a Monday about equities, bonds, currencies, and oil. Lisa OPEC with a bit of a surprise, a pop in oil. A sudden surprise move ahead of their meeting today, which starts at 8 a.m., uh, talking about possibly uh, cutting production by a million barrels or more, OPEC plus, in response to a lack of demand. Clearly, they have a price point that is very different from Joe Biden's price point. $84 on Brent crude. Remember, 69 on West Texas Intermediate. Two cups of coffee go. Edward Morris of Citigroup. Publishing moments ago. Thank you, Lee Brody, for bringing this to our uh, attention. And Edward Morse just says, really simple, there can be a price overshoot right now. Uh, we have him on in the six o'clock hour. So here's the question How much does this really reverse the narrative that we've heard about waning inflation, about disinflation, driven in part by the commodity sector in the face of slower growth? How much can OPEC Plus unilaterally change that narrative at a time when this administration has basically said in the U.S., we can no longer re fill our SPR in response to prices that are probably potentially going to overshoot to the upside. Get Ed Morrison this hour. We're thrilled. We get lucky with that, folks. He was previously booked, and now we got something to really uh, talk about. We're going to do equities here in a moment with Lori Calvacino. Lisa, over the weekend, your bond observation. There still is a big divide between the bulls and the bears, a question about whether we could get some sort of resurgent inflation. The OPEC plus narrative changed the game just a touch. You are seeing a sell-off today in Treasuries of people reimagining what it means <clears throat> for the Fed. Yeah. If you end up with a stickier commodity-driven story, how much can they push back against rate hikes and even to cut rates the way that a lot of people are expecting? You, okay, there you go. I was going to say, you, you nailed it. You, you follow the parlor game. Are we still talking about cutting interest rates? Because I thought guest after guest after guest just said last week said, eh, maybe not. Well, maybe not, but it's still priced into the market. There's about a four and a quarter percent uh, Fed funds rate that's priced in by January, which still implies quite a few uh, rate cuts. This is the problem. If you have sticky inflation book growth slowing. If you have stagflation, how does the Fed respond to that at a time when you know job cuts tend to percolate on top of themselves and have longer lasting consequences? John Farrell out today. Australia Grand Prix up at 1 a.m. Farrell was up watching it. Three red flags. He was distraught. Pierre Gasly is is thrown out of the next race. You're implying that's the reason why he's not here? Yeah, he's not here today because he was watching the Australian Grand Prix at like 1 a.m. in the morning. I'm going to do a data check. Lisa's going to save us with a really important Monday brief here. Red and green on the screen. The VIX under 20 shows you that bang up end of quarter equity market. Will that extend? A huge theme. We'll do that in a moment. And the bond market, we're watching, Lisa and I are both in agreement, two-year yield important, 4.09%, a seven basis point lift there, higher yield, lower note prices, oil front and center, 80 on uh, eighty on uh, NYMEX crude, I should say, Brent crude, 83.94. Uh, in the currency market, it's churn there. I'm watching euro Yen, sort of, is like something of interest this morning. We'll get there at some point. We need a Monday pre-jobs brief. Well, it just really highlights how unique what, the, uh, what we heard yesterday in terms of the OPEC Plus surprise <laughs> cut really is, because it was before the meeting that we hear today. 8 a.m., OPEC Plus is holding its joint ministerial monitoring committee meeting virtually. For them to make a move early without having forecast it, without having anyone expected it, really is what you're seeing in a market today that at one point was popping the most going back to 2007, yeah, at least when you look at the Brent market. Great chart on radio. This is a chart Lisa selected that really shows the resistance at 86, 87 on Brent crude. I did some fancy math, and I don't get a breakout until 9-0, $90 a barrel. Well, here's sort of the tension right now. What about weakening demand and potentially demand that could weaken even more if prices are elevated as we saw? last summer. At 8.30 a.m., perhaps we get a sense of what the Fed's response might be to this. St. Louis Fed President James Bullard is speaking with our own Michael McKee at 8.30 a.m. on Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the real issue. How does the Fed respond to something that is transitory? 
commodity prices historically have been uh, something that are more volatile at the time when people are starting to see some easing on that front, giving rise to perhaps some of this immaculate disinflation, and then kind of building on the manufacturing side. The manufacturing recession is expected to get deeper. We do get ISM manufacturing data for March today uh, at around 10 a.m. <clears throat> Throughout the day, we get U.S. light vehicle sales. Do we start to see some recovery around the edges? This is the problem with rolling recessions in different uh, asset uh. classes. Because if you get sort of the manufacturing sector starting to recover, how does that make a stickier inflation if you don't I, see an all-around decline altogether? We're going to do this in the 8 o'clock hour. It's going to be a theme for later this morning. Right now we're focusing on the markets. But to me, this theory of recession, and I'm like half the country's in recession. I mean, I just don't get the aggregate analysis of it. I, anecdotally, I talk to people that are middle income, middle professional income, and they're really struggling. I mean, it's not, they're not off on some fancy holidays with packed airplanes. Well, it's the classic, you know, <clears throat> inflation is a poor on, on uh, is a tax on the poor. Inflation is a tax on the people who have the least disposable income to spend. Very good. Let us move on into the second quarter of 2003 in the equity space. We do that with Lori Calvacina, head of U.S. equity strategy at RBC Capital Markets, a sensitive Calvacina over the weekend saying that the stock market is healing. We're all healing. Lori, how <laughs> injured were we and how are we healing right now? So, look, I think that what happened with SVB was a shock. I mean, and, and that's obviously, you know, what everybody said at the time. But, you know, those companies in particular were very well owned over time in the small and mid cap community. There are a lot of long only investors that knew those companies quite well, you know, sort of prior to the crypto era, prior, you know, to the you know, kind of most recent version of the tech bubble. And I think it was just an unanticipated, you know, kind of mini black swan event. And you've had a lot of investors just sort of staying quiet, digging in their heels, doing work. And what we know is that sentiment indicators were already pretty depressed, starting to recover a bit. And if you look at AAII, for example, it shot right back down and kind of went close to GFC type levels. Now, the brunt of the pain was obviously taken in the banks. Small caps were one of the babies, I think, essentially thrown out with the bathwater because of their cyclicality and because of that bank's exposure. Right. And what we saw over the past week was that the banks and the small caps performance really stabilized. And I think that's important because the banks are the problem child, essentially, of this crisis. If you look back to 2002, what we saw was that the NASDAQ 100 really started to stabilize after the WorldCom bankruptcy. And that's very different from what we right. saw banks do, the problem child of the GFC um, in 08 after the different bankruptcies and collapses there. So I think the market is telling you that investors are starting to you know, exhale a bit, even if they're not breathing easy just yet. But what's critical here, Lori, is if I take three groups of mid-cap, small-cap, I got the growthiness crew, very small group, I've got everybody else, and I've got the value trap of banks. Where do I put new money today? Do I buy the banks as a value proposition, or are they a trap? I think time is going to tell on the banks themselves. I think if you talk to Gerard um, and if you talk to ARF, they would tell you there's longer term value being created, but we do need to see a little bit more time to see the dust settle. I think if you look in small cap, though, banks were not the only things that were cheap. Energy was very cheap on a relative basis to both the R2 and the big cap names. Uh, consumer discretionary was something else that really jumped out us in recent months as being very undervalued in the small cap space, but still looking quite expensive, frankly, in the large cap space. So it might be more of the time now to be a stock picker in small cap as opposed to buying the index. But I do think there are bargains down there to be had, especially if GDP data and earnings data continue to forecast a recovery in 2024. Lori, after we got Silicon Valley Bank's demise and some of the other banks that really ran into trouble, a lot of people said this is a game changer. It potentially does shift the narrative quite significantly. Is the OPEC Plus news that we got over the weekend similar? You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about that this morning, Lisa, you know, especially in regards to the inflation narrative. Um, I think that they are sort of offsetting uh, forces with one another in terms of the inflation debate right now, <laughs> whereas SVB may have, you know, sort of put cuts back on the table in a bigger way. We obviously saw interest rate expectations ratchet down. Now you may see those, you know, kind of come back up a little bit, probably not to the same degree. But if you sort of put those aside, I'm not sure that there's been a lot of change in terms of other issues right now on the inflation debate. We know the services sector is weakening. We know that lay layoffs are probably going to keep wage growth in check. We know that CFOs from the Duke survey last week are talking about how prices 
and wage growth are both going to come down this year and next year. Their optimism um, is really waning for both this and next year. So I feel like the sources of inflation are generally on the mend. And now we've kind of got these two other big issues that are offsetting each other. I'm not sure I would call each of them game changers, but right. maybe major detours. So what is your here at the beginning of the second quarter? What is your 12 month lift in equities? So we don't do a 12-month forecast, but we've still got our year-end target for December 31st, and that we've still got 4,100. And we feel like that's a nice base case in here. We have yeah. done some valuation work, which suggests there could be some upside from that. I think to really get downside from that, you've got to assume that there's a recession that bleeds into 2024, and I don't think the case has been made for that yet. Lori Calvacina, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it with RBC Capital Markets this morning. Lisa, we got to do the levels on equity here. Uh, I was remiss not to start the week with that. 4,100, as Lori talks about, is her benchmark. 4,135, Standard & Poor's 500. Dow, can I, I can't believe I'm saying this, halfway to 34,000. I did not expect that. 33,579. NASDAQ, well over 13,000, 13,230. And a VIX under 20. And that's how you end a bull market. Is it an official bull market? I think so. Well, it was certainly when it came to the tech stocks, although a lot of people are basically sticking with their narrative, including Mike Wilson over the weekend coming yeah. out and basically saying that there's more to fall with tech. Tech shouldn't act as sort of uh, a staple or something that somehow is a conservative stock, that there still will be beta talking about. Um, we see little evidence that a new bull market has begun and believe the bear still has unfinished business. So just giving you a sense of where he's at. He also talked about the idea uh, that perhaps people were buying tech because they thought that the expansion in the Fed's balance sheet was somehow uh, stimulative for risk assets, a dynamic we don't <clears throat> ultimately believe to be the case. That was my question. Yeah, I'm going to call it the Ralph Van Kampora low. I love that. The acclaimed technical analyst Ralph Van Kampora literally wrote the textbook. His October low, he's heated. That's the low. And I was surprised by this. SPX, not Apple, not the rest, only up 13.9 percent, rounded up 14 that's not a bull market yet. Yeah, only. Yeah. Check out Meta. That's a bull market. <laughs> That's a bull and then another bull and then another bull. And how long can that keep running on the year yeah. of efficiency? The rolling plague here at Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm getting over it. We're protecting Bramo. She's in a hermetically sealed uh, uh, capsule this morning. No Stay with us. <laughs> Good morning. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The price of oil jumped today after OPEC Plus announced a surprise production cut of more than 1 million barrels a day. The coalition abandoned previous assurances that it would hold supply steady. Saudi Arabia led the cartel by pledging its own 500,000 barrel a day reduction. The White House calls a cutback ill-advised. UBS reportedly will cut its workforce by up to 30 percent after completing the takeover of Credit Suisse. That's according to a Swiss newspaper. The paper said that as many as 11,000 employees will be laid off in Switzerland and another 25,000 worldwide. Meanwhile, Swiss prosecutors are gathering evidence as part of a possible criminal investigation into the deal. The U.S., South Korea and Japan have begun naval exercises off the Korean Peninsula. It's a move certain to anger North Korea, which fired its first missile over Japan when similar drills were held last year. The two-day anti-submarine and rescue maneuvers started today. They include vessels from a U.S. aircraft carrier group. Donald Trump's lawyer says he'll plead not guilty when he appears in court in Manhattan on Tuesday. The former president will also look to have the case dismissed. He was indicted on Thursday, but the exact charges remain sealed. A grand jury was investigating his role in hush money payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels. And the entertainment conglomerate in debt. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. He's gearing up for a, a battle. Um, you know, this is something that obviously we believe is a political persecution, and I think people on both sides of the aisle believe that. That's a complete abuse of power. Um, he's a tough guy, George, as you know, and he's someone who's going to be ready for this fight. Um, we're ready for this fight. Tuesday's just the beginning. Lawyer up, and that is, of course, what Mr. Trump did early in 2023. Joe Tacopina 
is the lawyer to the former president there with George Stephanopoulos on ABC. Mr. Tecopina, uh, Lisa, it, it is legit Brooklyn prosecutor. He's handled all sorts of celebrities. Maybe one most accessible would be Alex Rodriguez on certain matters. He played for a baseball team, Thank you. not I Philly of the that. New York Mets. But, but this is the hard-nosed prosecutor that the former president's been looking for. The issue here is what does this do in terms of changing the race for the Republicans? What does this do on a policy front? And then how disruptive is this? For New York City, I know that they're gearing up for potential protests and disruptions, but also on a larger scale when it comes to bringing the former president back to the front and center. Right now, and we're going to avoid the frenzy of the next 48 hours or what we believe is the next 48 hours. The former president's private airplane is in Florida in the early morning light of Florida, maybe waiting to transport him today up to uh, New York. We'll see. Uh, how that goes. We're not going to follow the plane all the way into all the rest that so much of the rest of the media is going to do. But what we are going to do is get perspective. We do that now with Terrence Haynes. Terry Haynes is the founder of Pangea Policy. Uh, Terry, I want to get right to this. We'll do the data check at the end, folks. Not that much going on here. Terry, I was thunderstruck over the weekend at what we heard from Greg Vellier early in the soiree which is the reticence or tentativeness of everyone on all sides of this indictment debate over the future paths for the prosecutors. I've never witnessed such an uncertain legal process. Is that true? Ah, uh, Well, you know, it, what we've got here is a situation where, uh, you know, I think it's the, there's a weak uh, case here to be made. Uh, and... They're going to tart it up as much as they possibly can to try to, to, to try to get something going. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of analysis here that goes through pearl clutching, and you know, I'd, I'd warn everybody away from that. Uh, I'd also provide a little perspective, as you suggest. I mean, the idea that uh, that a New York City developer might be right. involved in uh, payments is, you know, shocking, and we should all be amazed at that. Uh, but. Uh, by and large, I mean, what you've got here is you've got an ability. You've got people saying that the, uh, the, the this process is deep flawed and and uh, then an overreach. Um, that that frankly has very little to do with the the amount of uh, support that Trump gets within the Republican Party or outside of it. Uh, it has everything to do with uh, right, the right. ability of folks to attack what is uh, what the most important <laughs> thing here is was the political motivation, which sixty percent see is. Uh, political right. motivation, according to recent polls, and 67 percent think Trump's payment was a personal expense. So, uh, yeah, they're playing to that. I mean, Terry, help me here, and I want to be as apolitical as we can. I don't want to do a Republican-Democrat thing. Right. Joe, Joe, uh, James Rather Robinault in the Washington Post this weekend harkened back to 1920 and Warren Harding. He was going to be on Mount Rushmore, but that didn't work out. Warren Harding presidency. I mentioned Wilbur Mills, uh, you know, I think it was on Friday of Arkansas. What changed? What changed from 1920 to 1974 to 2023? Uh, what changed, I think, is uh, changes and changes back is the uh, is the willingness Two things, really, the willingness of the media to sensationalize things. And uh, which waxes and wanes uh, over the decades, and uh, different media and all the rest. And uh, and secondly, you know, just frankly, how savvy uh, the average American is about uh, about politics. And they're a good deal savvier than uh, than most polls indicate. Uh, so you know, you, you've got this big split where uh, where for uh, media it is. Uh, present company accepted, It well, what we've got here is a situation where there's an, a huge amount of pearl clutching, while at the same time, you know, the, the country's seen eight or nine years of the Trump show now. And, you know, frankly, they, they're tired of it. So, and uh, that probably benefits people outside the Trump orbit. So let's move on from it for just a minute, Terry, because uh, we've been looking right now at the story of OPEC Plus coming out with a surprise cut of potentially a million or more barrels uh, of right. oil. And this raises a question of what's an administration to do at a time when they should be refilling or said that they would be refilling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. What is right. the policy response from Washington to this? Well, the policy response is uh, awfully outdated. You know, the, uh, the the response from the Biden administration was, you know, the, the awfully sniffy, uh, but without 
uh, substance. And the risk the, the president runs is getting overwhelmed by events. I mean, you've got a situation now where, you, you know, you've got, uh, you know, a, presented to the public, you've got a Ukraine stalemate, uh, no path out of that. You've got the Afghanistan withdrawal. You've got uh, the Saudis uh, and others uh, now being responsible for some increase in oil prices, how much we don't know, uh, hits us at a weak moment uh, with the SPR, as I think you rightly point out. Uh, you've got uh, the looming Iranian North Korea uh, difficulties, and you've got uh, China front and center in everybody's <clears throat> minds in that particular competition. On top of that now, you've got a reinvigorated uh, inflation risk, uh, you know, led by gasoline prices. Uh, that's a pretty toxic uh, uh, set of chemicals. Terry, do you feel like the sense in Washington is that this cut was politically motivated to sort of hit when they're down or hit at a particularly vulnerable moment with respect to getting oil prices higher? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know the you know the back and forth on Middle East politics and the uh, and the focus, frankly, on Saudi uh, to the ex exclusion of the rest of the Middle East presents two kinds of problems. One of them is the United States Saudi re Saudi relationships, uh, you know, and how that runs into OPEC plus and gasoline. The other half of this, I think, is less appreciated, which is that <clears throat> other countries around the Middle East uh, feel like the United States focus on Saudi actually denigrates them. Uh, uh, and makes broader uh, good relations uh, in the Middle East more difficult rather than less difficult. If you you know combine that even with, I'm thinking mostly of the Arab world, but uh, you can combine that with the Biden administration critique of Israel recently too. And what you see is uh, is an administration that's kind of <clears throat> dictating terms when they're in no position to dictate. Mm. Terry, thank you so much. Terry Haynes with an important Monday uh, prep there for what we will observe uh, Tuesday. Mr. Haynes with Pangea uh, Global Today. We got lucky. We booked Ed Morris just to book Ed Morris here a couple days ago. Boom, he brought us an OPEC Plus announcement. So we can blame him? Is that what we're saying? <clears throat> I don't know uh, about that, but it makes for good theater. Well, right now we are seeing certainly the geopolitical theater of the tit for tat with respect to dueling policies. And I really like what Halima Croft over at RBC had to say. She basically said, this shows the Fed is not the only central banker in town and monetary policy isn't the only central bank policy that's being uh, tweaked here on all sides there's also oil policy that's being used <clears throat> yes, and wielded yes, as yeah. a huge geopolitical uh tool what i thought halima said was great was this is as much about the saudis and that they have new friends you know clearly alluding to the the vits with, with china and of course the long term trend with Russia as well. This is, there's a lot of power. And of course, that's Ed Morris's wheelhouse. It'll be great to talk to him about that. And to be coming after the more than 5% decline in crude last quarter, we're starting a new quarter with a new narrative, uh, at least on the margins. I and agree. It raises well, a said. well said. Well said. It really raises yeah. a question about how much people have to rip up the script and how much they can stick to what they know and say, you know what, either way, this will just accelerate some sort of disinflationary lack of demand or else we will see. But the heart of the matter here, folks, as we begin on an eventful week, lots of economic data through to the jobs report on Friday. And we'll go beneath the headline data on Friday, as we always uh, do with a great lineup. But I, I love your idea, Lisa, of is this like a continuation of the shock and surprise of the first quarter or is it a new narrative? I'm clearly in the camp. It's a new narrative. And we've seen that with bank deposit flows, which are actually quiescent for two days or so. I think it's fair to say it's a new narrative, because if you blink, there'll be another new narrative that comes down the pike. And that's sort of how it's been going for the past couple of months. But yeah. there is a feeling that this OPEC plus decision was actually quite significant in that it indicated a willingness yeah. to really take action. Stay with us here on radio and television. Lots going on. A must listen for Global Wall Street. Edward Morris of Citigroup joining us here in 15 minutes. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Surveillance, Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keane. Good morning to all of you. Jonathan Farrell on assignment after a late night Australian Grand Prix uh, is as well. We got to do a market check. We were so fired up with uh, Terry Haynes of Pangea. We missed it the last time around. Red and green on the screen right now. The VIX comes in under 2019.59. BitDog 28,000 showing the enthusiasm there. Two year yield. Do I care about 4.09? I mean, it's not yes. really a drama number. It's is not it? the level, it's the direction. It's the <clears> fact <throat> that people are starting on the margins to rethink a rate 
rate hike cycle or a rate cut cycle that they had priced in previously yeah. because of potentially higher oil for longer. Nothing from curve inversion. I'm sorry, the 10-year real yield gets my attention as we compress down. It's sort of a grind. It's not very romantic, but 1.19% on the 10-year real yield gets my attention. And then I go over to euro yen. Uh, I mean, oil making the splash today, no pun intended. But euro yen out to 144.80. That would be stunning if Europe breaks out stronger versus a surprisingly weak yen. I don't think anybody's looking. That's sort of inside baseball. Uh, right now, what people are pricing in is the likelihood that the EC. I said inside baseball. I got there that. Because you wanted to get to the Mets and how they won. I, wa I, I, I watched the Mets for the first time since 1986. Good morning, Len Dykstra. And this Japanese guy they got, Senga, he is phenomenal. He was almost in tears when he came off the mound. Congratulations that you haven't watched the Mets from 1986 until now, smarter. because that means that you really I mean, picked some good times. David Kelly's like, wait, you're a Red Sox fan. Why are you watching the Mets? But I actually, it was fun watching the Steve Cohens. They were very good. Well, that's that happens occasionally every, you know, couple decades. Listen, Thank it's you. really going to be interesting to see uh, how it, and I just want to go back to crude for a second because we're seeing uh, more than a 5% pop in Brent crude. Yeah. And at one point, it was more than 8%. And this comes after a quarter of losses. And it comes as the Fed's trying to figure out how to handle this. St. Louis Fed President James Bullard sitting down with Bloomberg's Michael McKee earlier. David Kelly of J.P. Morgan on the disinflationary camp talking about possibly upcoming data continuing to show moderation inflation, uh, writing, quote, softer data may be just enough to keep the Fed from tightening again on May 3rd. Third, while recession is a very close call, slow growth and moderating inflation looks very likely, as does Fed easing and lower long-term interest rates in 2024. So the disinflation camp, do oil prices change that, Tom? I, I Time will tell. I, I think it's the magnitude of the price move. A 5% move up to 80, I've got on a chart basis, I need 90 to get, you know, excited, if you will. Uh, and frankly, J.P. Morgan out of their London desk with some huge leadership on the, the case to get to $100 a barrel, I'm not sure it's there uh, this morning. What we can do on April is get a brief here into the second quarter. We do that with David Kelly, Chief Global Strategist, J.P. Morgan Asset Management. I'm going to cut to the rewrite of your your outlook for the year. Everyone's doing this now. pharaoh has got his uh, – John Farrell, look for it, out March 31 mm -hmm. is his year ahead uh, view for nine months. And for you, it's a stunning statement. You're looking for negative job growth, some form of negative non-farm payrolls. It's out there somewhere. How does that change our world? Well, uh, absolutely. In fact, the Federal Reserve is themselves, as far as I can tell, because if you actually look at their forecast from the middle of March and you make some reasonable assumptions about labor force growth, their unemployment forecast suggests that we're going to get some negative payrolls, perhaps losing three, 400,000 jobs between March and, and the end of the year. So, yeah, I think that's likely. I mean, there, there is, it, it's kind of like you're on a really sunny day and you look at the weather forecast and there's this bad weather coming. That's and called it's Rochester, here. New York, in case you didn't <laughs> know, you just described well, Rochester. Continue. Well, we can, we can see this coming because uh, we had a, we've got fiscal drag. There, there are fewer individual income tax right. refunds. Uh, we've got uh, all of that. Plus now we've got the, the credit tightening yeah. It's going to be particularly affecting the small business sector, and that is going to slow the economy. And, and we, we can see it all over the place. Uh, now, higher oil prices push up the headline CPI number, mm -hmm. but they are fundamentally disinflationary for the U.S. economy because they, they take money out of the hands of right. lower middle income consumers, and they will just you know spend less on other things. So if I were in the Federal Reserve's uh, position here, I would not look at higher oil prices as a reason to get tighter. It's actually a reason right. to get, it get easier. Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley's an equity guy, goes all economics on us this weekend. And Mike Wilson says, look, M2 growth is the lowest it's been in 60 years, at least 60 years, he said. How does that fold in? I mean, you had the Biden stimulus. So Olivia Blanchard talks about a Biden stimulus. You've got this massive shrinking down. We'll get to Adam Tooze's wonderful essay here over the weekend. But the bottom line is, how do you fold this new restriction into your equity market analysis? I don't think I don't think M2 tells you very much. I mean, for, over those 60 years, for about 30 of them, M2 told you something. And after that, it doesn't tell you anything. Mm -hmm. So I, I just don't think money supply is in it. But it's use, cratered. Well, of course, yeah, it has created as, as as rates have gone up, and people can get uh, get better rates on other instruments outside of M2. But 
but overall, you know, the, the narrative of a slowing economy, the, the point is we're on the edge of something, but we're not on the edge of a cliff, we're on the edge of a swamp. It is, we're just going to slowly slide into something pretty weak here, and inflation is going to grind lower, and we just, need, we just need to have a little patience and let this unfold. Well, patience is something that this market has none of, and yes. right now you talk about how higher oil prices may actually be even more disinflationary. No. However, it won't feel that way, and it won't be borne out necessarily in the data. So if the Fed does not cut rates as much as the market is currently currently pricing, what is the outlook for risk assets? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's payment now, payment later. I mean, if the Fed doesn't cut rates later on this year, they're going to have a, a more significantly weak problem going into next year, and they're going to cut then. Because remember, there's not going to be any fiscal aid here. No, There's going to be no fiscal stimulus until 2025 at the, at the earliest, and this economy is going to be sucking for air in 2024 because it's not going to have enough demand. And, in, in, and I don't mean demand for oil, I mean demand for anything. So the economy is going to be slowing and the Fed is going to have to cut rates in 2024. If they decide not to raise rates on, March on May 3rd, if they decide to cut rates a little earlier before the end of the year, maybe give us one rate cut, that will ease the amount that they have to cut rates in 2024. But they, they'll have to cut them. Within negative non-farm payrolls, I, I mean, they're going to be under extraordinary political pressure. There also is negative this, statistics. There's also going to be extraordinary weakness, and this has really been the distinction for a lot of strategists talking about the potential for rate cuts, as Tom was talking about, not necessarily being stimulative. In fact, really coming on the heels of a great deal of weakness, you talk about lower long-term yields. How low could 10-year Treasury yields go in a scenario where this is a swamp? Well, I, I mean, I think there is a limit there. I don't think we're talking about a one-handle um, or... Perhaps not, you know, two to two and a half. But I think you get, you know, two and a half to three and a half in a ten-year treasury um, by the as, at some stage in 2024. Uh, I don't think the. I, I hope. I hope the Federal Reserve is not going to resume the pattern of trying to get down to a zero lower bound negative real rates. It doesn't work. They've got to get back down to a more normal level of real rates for the long run, assuming a low inflation rate in the long run. So how do you really get enthusiastic about any risk assets in an environment where people are overly optimistic, in your view, that people that it can kind of chug along, that we're not going to get negative payrolls prints? Well, they may be overly optimistic on the real economy. Uh, but if you, if you end up in a sort of a swamp, uh, U.S. companies make profits in swamps. Uh, because they like it when it's a little bit soft. They can always argue with the workers, oh, you don't need a pay increase, or we can't give you a pay increase. They can find way, ways of cutting costs. They can restore margins. So I think that profitability will yeah. rise again in 2024. And so long as you've got low rates, that, under, uh, that underpins all of financial assets. So you know, I do think they're cheaper things than, than U.S. equities. I think international equities are a lot cheaper. Uh, but, but overall, low rates is really the key for risk assets. I didn't realize this, Lisa. Obviously, negative payrolls April of 2020, March of 2020, in the pandemic shock, you have to go back to 2010. This is the last time the Mets won. September of 2010 <laughs> was the last negative statistic on non-farm payrolls. But going back to 1986, they won the championship. So there yeah, you they, go. They, they, <laughs> you keep on saying that. I think they beat the Red Sox that year, and I sort of remember with pain. So keep please don't up. talk about that. <laughs> Lenny Dykstra hit a ball. Oil Cam Boyd put that orb in. Dykstra hit the. It's never come down. It went over Everett, Massachusetts, last seen right. northeast okay, of Marblehead. Just, just stop, but this is painful. <laughs> All right, so let's shift. Let's go back to just sort of the bread and butter, as you're talking about. It's sort of odd to come out with a pretty negative prognostication for the economy, but re be really constructive on uh, risk assets to basically say this all paves the way for a pretty good return. But, but you, you, could, you could have said that at the start of this year also, and, and we actually had a pretty good first quarter. Uh, you know, stocks up about seven percent, bonds up about three percent. It's been. I mean, we. You know, this is this is sort of the start of a new quarter for us. We put out our, our second quarter guide to the markets, which is a big production in in, in my area. And uh, you know, when we look when we look at what happened in the in the first quarter, yeah, you could easily have, have had that narrative and had the market go down, and it didn't. And I think the reason it didn't is because inflation is gradually coming down. I think people can look at that and they realize that you know, if inflation comes down, the uncertainty caused by a sudden spiral in inflation is going away. And that's probably the single most important factor for financial markets. Where are you on cash right now? Well, cash I, I, got humbled last quarter. Yeah, and it's, it's not a great long-term investment. You know, what we find is that when you get to peak cash rates, yeah, it's good. But you've got to reinvest it at some stage. And almost always, fixed income actually beats cash over the following year. So it's, it's you, you know, even though the cash yields are enticing, remember, you're going to have to reinvest it. Guys, what you just heard there from Dr. Kelly is religion. It's gospel. 
It's not getting out of the market going to cash. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's wildly asymmetric to me. It's mm -hmm. the getting back into the market, yeah. which is brutal. David Kelly, thank you uh, so much. Really, really appreciate that, David Kelly and I. Uh, well, the Red Sox are in some spirited effort here. Mohamed Alarian watching in England, uh, emails in uh, Lisa. He's very impressed. Alarian's looking at the importance of the oil decision. He's looking at the multi-prudential, the macro-prudential analysis of oil that we'll get from Ed Morrison in, in a moment. Alarian also noticing that Kodai Senga had a win here for the Mets. Thank you. Uh, on this weekend, Dr. Alarian. LGM. On top yes. Of the Mets. Another Mets fan. Look, this <clears throat> is going to be a really interesting moment, and I do wonder how many other look forwards really get completely revised on the heels of what happened during the first three months of this year. Honestly, this has been a tremendous roller coaster, and well, we're poised for yet another one with a lot of disparate views. And to me, the takeaway this morning is. People are not shifting. They are hunkering down in their belief and saying either the weather's going to change and you guys aren't buying <clears throat> enough canned goods, or they're saying and you guys aren't smelling the roses because the sun's still out. I've just looked at this, Lisa. Uh, as Standard & Poor's still negative 10% one-year trailing. Dow Jones, negative 4% one-year trailing. NASDAQ 100, I didn't realize this, negative 14%, even with that bang-up first quarter. It was more, to me, uh, all of what Calvacino was talking about, a healing quarter which is the than reason, like a, a bull market victory. Well, which is the reason why some people think that tech could keep rallying, because it lost so much, and now it's efficient. Now it's the year of efficiency with all of the job cuts and other people saying, eh, not so quickly. We haven't actually had the recession yet, so we don't know. Coming up, our, a conversation of the day on this news from the Middle East. Edward Morris will join us. He's Global Head of Commodity. He's at City Research at Morris on the path to $100 a barrel. Stay with us worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. A surprising move from OPEC Plus as the coalition makes an oil production cut of more than 1 million barrels a day. Oil futures soared following the new inflation risk. Saudi Arabia led the cartel by pledging its own 500,000 barrel a day supply reduction. The White House said the cutbacks were ill-advised. Former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson is entering the race for the Republican nomination for president. Hutchinson has been critical of former President Trump. He told ABC that people want leaders that appeal to the best of America and not simply appeal to the worst instincts. In Finland, Prime Minister Sanna Marin has lost to a pro-business opposition group in close parliamentary elections. Marin's Social Democrats finished in third place with the center-right National Coalition declaring victory. Now that puts Pateri Orpo on track to become Prime Minister. He's overseeing the finance, interior and agriculture portfolios in two governments. Tesla reported record deliveries in the first quarter. Still, the number fell short of the pace needed to meet Elon Musk's goal of 50% annual growth. The electric vehicle maker delivered almost 423,000 cars after it cut prices. And in sports, LSU is a new champion of women's college basketball. The Tigers beat Iowa 102-85 to win the NCAA title in Dallas. LSU's Angel Reese had 15 points, 10 rebounds, and was named the most outstanding player. It was Coach Kim Mulkey's fourth national title. She won three others at Baylor. For Iowa, Caitlin Clark had 30 points. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. When I think a supply shock like this, um, I think, okay, well, prices are going to rise. It's going to it's going to destroy demand, um, and that's going to feed into recession. So I think the way it's going to impact on on yields is going to be is going to be feeding through through that channel rather than kind of what immediately happens to um, uh, to, to to demand as a result of a rise in prices. Free of being with T.S. Lombard there on the news of the day. If you're just joining, if you're just waking up across the nation, OPEC in Saudi Arabia with their leadership changed the dialogue right now on the data front. Uh, uh, West Texas up to 80, Brent crude up to 84. 
And a lot of study over what all agree is a shock, is a surprise as well. Red and green on the screen right now. Equities really not reacting lower. Off that news, even Bitcoin up 300. The 10 year, uh, the two year yield, two year 4.09, 10 year 3.51 percent. Lisa, what's your data observation this morning? Just the fact that you're seeing a lift in yields on the heels of what we're seeing in the oil sector, the idea that perhaps this will pressure the Fed to go further. You know, this is sort of a contention. David Kelly saying the opposite, that it actually could potentially right. make them them less restrictive because he believes higher oil prices inherently are disinflationary. What we're going to do right now and what we understand is each and every strategist and economist on oil is different is take a geopolitical view. Yes, there's Amrita Sen, who's wonderful on the microeconomics of it. Francisco Blanche at Bank of America with a really holistic job. Jeff Curry over at Goldman Sachs. But there is no one, and I mean no one, like Edward Morris, Global Head of Commodities, City Research, who has combined academics with the, with the, uh, uh, the global politics of hydrocarbons. Ed Morris briefs us this morning. Ed, you divide into west of Suez Canal and east of Suez Canal. I want you to talk about the power of this coalition around Saudi Arabia with the Strait of Hormuz and onto the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. What power do they hold? Well, the power that they hold is an ability to cut and an ability to add oil to the market. And that's pretty incredible because as a group, they have shutting capacity that's well over 2 million barrels a day. And they're coming off a banner year in terms of revenue generation. That's it, something they want to keep. And they, if they want to cut a million barrels a day, they've just shown that they have the power to do it. I literally have on my coffee table uh, at at home another firm's analysis to over $100 a barrel, which centers on EM recovery and China recovery. You were brilliant in calling for lower quiescent Brent crude prices. Do you need to reverse this morning and to begin to consider $100 a barrel oil? Well, we're considering higher prices than we otherwise had. And yes, there is a scenario for $100 barrel oil, but I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. To get to $100 oil, we'd have to have significantly more oil taken out of the market and have a lot of uncertainty based on that oil taken out of the market. That is to say, it would come from a disruption to supply in countries such as Iran, Iraq, Libya, Nigeria, all together at the same time. And we would have no sense because of the domestic situation in those countries of when that oil could come back into the market. We have what we consider to be an effort to prevent the repeat of 2008-9 when we had oil prices collapsing from 147 to the low 40s before getting to a normalized level of $90 a barrel. It took about a year and a half to have all of that uh, display work out given financial flows uh, and given the uncertainties in the market. We have the financial flows now and we don't have quite that level of uncertainty. We know that supply is definitely coming into the market. I believe strongly that the increase in prices that we've already had is going to place uh, U.S. production on a higher path to growth than we otherwise might have had. Uh, and we think we're thinking that uh, on first blush, looking at everything at the moment overnight, uh, that we're going to have a fairly balanced market, uh, a, a market that's going to be plus or minus a couple hundred thousand barrels a day, no big inventory build, no big inventory draw. And on uh, on the demand picture that you were looking at, I, I have to say we flatly disagree. We think we're in a period of time when we're seeing demands last hurrah. Uh, we're seeing, to be sure, growth in China that's formidable. It basically makes up for the loss of uh, demand growth, uh, demand decline in China a year ago. And we don't think after this increase in demand from China, we're going to see uh, Chinese demand ratcheting up much further. Uh, yes, there is EM growth and India leads, but that's that's going to be in the three or 400,000 well, barrel a day range, not a million barrel a day range. Ed, can you frame out then how much of a surprise this cut was, which was unexpected, and comes at a time where some people are speculating that it was politically motivated to send a message to Washington and to possibly boost oil prices, meaning more cuts down the road if it doesn't work? 
No, I think it was definitely designed to boost oil prices. They countries were look just looking at sixty dollar oil straight on, and yes, they've seen a rally based on a whole bunch of things that they consider to be temporary, not permanent. And uh, yes, they want higher oil prices. Or the the countries that we were looking at, particularly Saudi Arabia, has a significantly higher fiscal break even than uh, a lot of other countries, and. Uh, they're more comfortable with oil, certainly with an $80 base and not bad with a $90 base. They didn't see too much in the way of damage to the global economy at $90 a barrel last year. I don't think we're staring in the face of 100. We're certainly flirting with a market which could see uh, a, a more demand in spring and summer than we otherwise thought might be. But I think the price is going to cap that demand. Uh, and we're we're going to see, you know, we, we, we were looking at a world of around 1.4, 1.5 million barrel a day demand. Yes, OPEC was at a higher level than that. Uh, and uh, there was some political factor, I think, involved in their own very tight uh, uh, supply demand balance, even in their last report. Uh, this goes against that and, uh, and says, hey, there's something going on. And I think it's a defense that's going on. They want the higher oil prices. They need it in order to revamp and reinvest in their economies as rapidly as possible. Uh, but they have no better interest in $100 oil than uh, most other countries do. They don't want to see a demand decline. They want to prevent the drop of $100 that we saw or a drop of more than 50 percent in today's market that they saw in 2008. But quickly, but, but quickly, Ed, just based on what you're saying, if they want higher prices and 80, uh, perhaps $80 is the floor, maybe $90, then what's to stop OPEC Plus from cutting further and further even as the economy slows? There are a couple of things that stop it. One is that the economies would slow a lot faster than they're, they're now slowing, and they don't want that to happen. They, they understand fully well that Chinese growth is not uh, exploding the way people thought it was. You look at the numbers, yes, there was a million barrels a day of growth, but that mm -hmm. was Chinese New Year. And that always happens. There's nothing nothing about this, this particular uh, rebound in China that you can get uh, reinforced in your view by what happened. They're really concerned about a drop in oil prices. They just looked at a drop to the 60s, and they're looking back right. at 2008, 9 And I think they made a terrible judgment on that. They think they'll find out that that judgment was terrible, because this is not 2008, 9 in multiple ways. Ed do you give an OK score to the Biden administration? They seem to be a pinata, even pro, anti-oil, whatever. Everybody's beaten up on our president's energy policy. Are you piling on? Are you beaten up on President Biden's energy policy? Uh, well, yes, certainly. And certainly at the beginning of the administration, there was nobody, virtually nobody in the administration that came out of the markets anywhere in the world. They were all people coming from academia, people coming from a very strong uh, pro-environmental, anti-fossil fuel bias, uh, and they didn't really understand markets. They were forced to understand markets. They've gained a lot better understanding of markets. We've just seen a you know, reopening of bids on federal lands. Uh, there's legislation that's going to assure that. And uh, they know in the White House that uh, they don't want to see higher gasoline prices. And the way to do that is by having uh, the U.S. be the strong power that it is, as, by the way, now the world's largest gross exporter of oil at a country where demand has already softened tremendously, where our demand is down well over a million barrels a day year on year, and our economy is not in bad shape. So we're seeing a transformation at home uh, where we've become kind of a critical swing supplier, and Saudi Arabia is very, uh, very sensitive and aware of that. Ed, thank you so much for joining us. Edward Morris of Citigroup here on the shock announcement from OPEC Plus and a com combination of the Persian Gulf countries here. It's not just about Saudi Arabia as well. Lisa, to me, the real takeaway there was I believe Dr. Morris reaffirmed that it will not be Chinese demand, Pacific Rim demand to the rescue. He basically reaffirmed his arch successful call of last year. And I think a lot of people are getting on board because there just isn't the same kind of driver of an acceleration in that yeah. economy at a time when unemployment's still pretty high for younger people and a lot of the consumption is domestically focused. Red and green on the screen, futures fractional negative two, the VIX uh, churning 19.62. We're looking at Brent crude 84.21. Please stay with us. Pork Garvey was lights out the last time he was on. Pork Garvey of ING. Next.
The Fed is not thinking pause right now. They're thinking about inflation. They're thinking about a pre-March 8th world. If they pause, what does the market do in response to that? The biggest source of policy error right now is for the Fed to worry about what's happening to a couple of bad banks. We should have some short-term volatility, probably slower economic growth, bad news from the Fed. I think we're in this environment for some time. There's going to be opportunities. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. A week of non-farm payrolls. We'll have the jobs report on Friday. We've got a stagger to that early in the second quarter with a shock announcement from OPEC Plus on oil. And yes, we just saw with Ed Morris, higher oil prices, Lisa, across West Texas and Brent. So here is the real underlying question that a lot of people are asking this morning. Are high or higher oil prices inflationary or disinflationary? Right now, the market <clears throat> suggests inflationary based on the lift that you're seeing in yields. But a lot of people have come on so far say disinflationary because it will reduce demand even further and reduce the amount of dis discretionary spending people have. I'll go to Emery to set on this, the microeconomics and the, the, the elasticity, the responsiveness that you see in supply and in demand as well. And I find it always interesting that a pro like Dr. Morris always ends up with a demand analysis. He would suggest China and the Pacific Rim are not yet there for $100 a barrel. A lot of people would agree. So we have a new <clears throat> quarter now. Last quarter, the narrative started as sort of this disinflationary. Triple cash worked out last quarter. Thank of, you for bringing that up, Lisa. <laughs> of potential, uh, potential soft landing, no landing, which quickly came to, are we getting the hard landing with the banking struggles? And now, is oil kind of going to be some of the swing factor that we see heading into the next three months? You know, what's important here, you know, I, I think we've got to go back as well and, and look at what we didn't do last quarter is you and I didn't load the boat on Apple. Young Dan Ives was on on Friday and you you were begging him on the break. Would you just give us a price target change? He had the audacity to lift up his Apple call from a 190 to 205. And it's again on the China you know, he didn't say China's going to boom, but he said, I'm sorry, China's there to be constructive. Yeah, and your household is permanently <clears throat> buying uh, a series of AirPods again and again. <clears throat> that will definitely lift the yeah, uh, potential earnings, earnings uh, optimism. Here is the sort of rub with, with tech, right? Does tech continue to get a boost from rates going lower on the heels of slower growth? Does it basically get a valuation boost and then continue to get see demand yeah. steady? Or is this going to be something that suffers if we do get a downturn like Mike Wilson saying? Thanks Everybody out with a readjustment of their year end. John Farrow writing his market outlook always with a March 31 launch. He's on a road show today. <laughs> he's on, you know, he's like three cities, you know. Yeah. I think well, he's in Denver for lunch. I can't ring. Remember as well. Let's do a data check here. We've got a very important guest uh, coming up. A huge acclaim the last time he was on. We need a brief from Lisa as well. Red and green on the screen. The VIX comes in under 20. We begin the second quarter with certainly a resiliency that, that stunned a lot of the gloom crew here over the last 90 days. Bitcoin over 28,000 confirms that. The yield 4.10% in the two-year breakout above 4.11 would get my attention. We're not there. The 10-year yield, 3.52%. Uh, As I noted earlier, the real yield comes in 1.18% on the 10-year inflation-adjusted yield, the measurement that I use. And I'd also note an accommodative Bloomberg Financial Conditions uh, Index. Brent crude, 84 almost $85 a barrel rounded up as we will. You're going to brief us. Are we briefy today? <laughs> well, yeah, 8 a.m. really is the key moment because OPEC Plus has its joint no, ministerial monitoring committee. it's when you open the show. It's going to be uh, <laughs> Meeting virtually. <clears throat> Perhaps we'll get a signal of what went into this decision to cut production by more than a million barrels a day. Halima Croft of RBC had a fantastic note over the weekend yes. saying, this move signals that Saudi Arabia will seek to short circuit further macro sell-offs and that Jay Powell is not the only central banker that matters. Washington and Riyadh simply have different price targets for their key policy initiatives, and that's what we heard from Ed Morris, too. They want prices higher, period, full stop. Yeah, and he said very clearly 2022 was a lesson for not only the Saudis, but also, again, I really want to emphasize here, folks, this is not just Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, in that Yusuf Gamal al Din was reporting from Dubai uh, there on the collegiality around the Persian Gulf to get this oil price up 
as well. What else do you have? 8.30 a.m., we hear from St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard. He'll be speaking to our own Michael McKee. This is uh, important. And this is going to be really interesting because what is the reaction function from a Federal Reserve that people are expecting to cut rates in the face of deceleration? They have insight. Is the banking crisis <clears throat> over? Can we move on from that? Okay. How much is credit going to tighten? What is the uh, implication as far as how much that will slow the economy? We'll get all of those uh, fabulous questions and much more, I'm sure, from Michael McKee as he speaks with James Bullard. And today we get some data. To me, this is going to be interesting. We've seen a recession in manufacturing. Does it deepen? We will get that U.S. ISM manufacturing data for March. We'll also get U.S. light vehicle sales. Again, you know, these rolling recessions, and I know that you kind of poo-pooed <clears throat> them last time around when I said it, but different sectors have had very different economic cycles. We have seen that coming out of the pandemic. How does that affect an overall kind of view on inflation, which is yeah. so difficult to get uh, to sum the parts? That's certainly nuanced uh, to say uh, the least. Let's launch on to a guy that had a huge impact on our show 10 days, two weeks ago. We asked Port Garvey, head of global debt and rate strategy at ING Financial Markets, to come back. And I'll make it clear, folks, your mail, your emails, your tweets to Lisa at 2 a.m., all of that is important on who we put on the show. And there was a primal screen, Porrick. Get that guy, get that guy at ING, get him back on the show. Pork, you are looking at our search for general equilibrium, let's start with the ugly. How out of whack are we right now? So uh, th thanks for the kind words, Tom, for a start, uh, and, and it's great to be back. So we've been out of whack for quite some time. I, I think you go right back to the housing bubble in Japan three decades ago, um, very reminiscent to what we're seeing on a number of occasions over the past couple of decades in Western Europe and the US. And I mean, long story short, that resulted in the banking crisis and a real ballooning in government debt, which people seem to have forgotten about. We roll on to where we are now, and we seem to be going through a number of mini crises. Uh, people aren't talking about debt at all, but we got to remember that debt here in the US is almost one and a half times the size of the economy. I mean, it's not quite there, but it's heading in that direction. Um, and we're facing into a really difficult cycle period. So the, I mean, the bigger picture um, inability to get to an equilibrium is there in the background and will always come back to bite us. But it's being frustrated by these ongoing struggles that we have right. with respect to monetary policy, getting to a neutral rate and uh, markets getting to where you could define markets as being at an equilibrium. We haven't been there for a long time, Tom. This dovetails in, folks, to without question my read of the weekend. Adam Tooze is so good on economics. We've seen him many times at, uh, at Davos. This is Professor Tooze, is Pork Garvey, talks about how out of kilter we are. We are in the astonishing macro financial switchback of 2020 to 23. The nominal GDP of debt ridden Italy is increasing so fast that, well, to Q3 of 2023, its debt-to-GDP ratio fell year-on-year year by almost 7 percent. That's a stunning outcome. How we see our financial institutions through this giant trillion-dollar rebalancing. Park, what time frame do you have to a trillion-dollar rebalancing out of the pandemic? Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a decades-long process. Tom, I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm looking at how we got to where we currently are. Look, we had the great financial crisis 15 years ago. We had a pandemic a couple of years ago. And these crises just push us off kilter and make it very difficult to get back to where we need to. I think the key thing for me ahead is can the Federal Reserve move into a rate cutting period and for that to be enough of a cushion to get the economy back on, on trend to avoid having to get back down to zero. Now, the call that, that I have, that we have, is that it won't be necessary for the Fed to go to zero. Um, our call is that they head down to three, maybe slightly below three. That'll be huge. If we can get there for the first time in over 15 years, we would have returned to some semblance of stability in terms of where the bottom for the funds rate is. Porek, how has your view for the rest of the year changed for the second quarter versus where it was three months ago? So one of the things that, that we did know before Silicon Valley Bank went down and we went through the banking angst we've had recently is that 
lending standards in the US have tightened considerably. And the whole banking ang story really emphasizes the point that things are going to be really tough going forward in terms of ability to get access to credit. And if you look at as how that correlates with the unemployment rates and GDP growth, it's only one way. And what it means is, with conviction, the unemployment rate is going to rise, and it's going to rise fast and furious. Um, we don't go to 10%, but we could easily go to 5 or 6%, and the economy is going to go into a recession. Wow. And this, we'll, see this, we'll see this panning out over the course of Q2, but more into Q3 this year. Lending standards, the tightening thereof, never gets it wrong. It does push the economy into recession. Right. It's so important for us here in the U.S. Pork, thank you so much. Pork Garvey of ING, uh, really brilliant there and linking all this together. And Lisa, what's so important there is the ING heritage. They absolutely nailed 9 and 10 percent unemployment in the last cycle. They, they, James Kingsley and the team there, Knightley rather, excuse me, they, they led the charge there on a 10 percent unemployment. Lending standards never get it wrong. <clears throat> and that's basically what he was yeah. saying. Yeah. You watch the fact that lending yeah. standards are tightening pretty dramatically, which is the reason why May 8th right. is the date that everyone's waiting for to get that senior loan officer survey to understand <clears throat> just how rapidly it is tightening. I I'm biased here on what Adam too said, and you heard it from a Pork Garvey as well, that nominal GDP is a very bright light, and it can be good for corporations where they see more buoyant revenue as well. And it reminds me of the, the true investment value giant, Phil Correa of Pioneer Group, uh, living to, I think he was 103 or 104. And Mr. Correa would always say the bright lights of inflation, and they're on us, which is maybe why the cautious crew got the first quarter so wrong, that inflation helped out corporations. You write about nominal GDP and just this idea <clears throat> that inflation can boost the bottom line only until you get some sort of substantial until layoff right something. and this is this is the concern yeah. when you start talking about five to six percent unemployment that's hundreds of thousands of people who are going to be losing their jobs they aren't going to spend as much there's going to be less conviction and that's the concern that layoffs can lead to layoffs and that it's very difficult to game yeah. out and get perfectly right and be surgical with this first business day of a second quarter of this most original 2023 this is bloomberg surveillance Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The price of oil jumped today after OPEC Plus announced a surprise production cut of more than 1 million barrels a day. The coalition abandoned previous assurances that it would hold supply steady. Saudi Arabia led the cartel by pledging its own 500,000 barrel a day reduction. The White House calls the cutback ill-advised. The entertainment conglomerate Endeavor has agreed to combine with World Wrestling Entertainment. They'll form a new publicly listed company in a deal valued at more than force by up to 30 percent after completing the takeover of Credit Suisse. That's according to a Swiss newspaper. The paper said as many as 11,000 employees will be laid off in Switzerland and another 25,000 worldwide. Meanwhile, Swiss prosecutors are gathering evidence as part of the possible criminal investigation into that deal. The U.S., South Korea and Japan have begun naval exercises off the Korean Peninsula. It's a move certain to anger North Korea, which fired its first missile over Japan when similar drills were held last year. The two-day anti-submarine and rescue maneuvers started today. They include vessels from a U.S. aircraft carrier group. Donald Trump's lawyer says he'll plead not guilty when he appears in court in Manhattan on Tuesday. The former president will also look to have the case dismissed. He was indicted on Thursday, but the exact charges remain sealed. A grand jury was investigating his role in hush money payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I have made a decision, and my decision is I'm going to run for president of the United States. I've traveled the country for six months. I hear people talk about the leadership of our country, and I'm convinced that people want leaders that appeal to the best of America and not simply appeal to our worst instincts. Took a quiz here to start the block, and only Amory Horton got correct that he is the 46th governor of the state of Arkansas. Asa Hutchinson there, Republican from Arkansas with ABC This Week. 
uh, and I guess jumping into the ring as well. We're going to digress here. Red and green on the screen. The VIX uh, constructive at an under 20 level. We're watching Brent crude 84.50 rounded up, $85 a barrel, maybe up 6% as well in the OPEC Plus News. Lisa wants to chat that up. But first, we are going to go to our chief indictment correspondent, Amory Horton here. And I, I do want to get to tomorrow in all that. But if you read the biography of Governor Hutchinson of Arkansas, he's everything the former president can't stand about the Republican Party. How far apart is Hutchinson and Trump? Well, they're very far apart. But we should also remember the former governor also did support Trump previously when he was running for president. He became uh, very adamant and critical of him uh, when January 6th happened. Mm -hmm. And now he is saying that this indictment is a distraction. It's not a distraction for the former president. He's a can as he's a candidate as well. He's not just right. a former president. He's a candidate for the Republican Party. He's leading the polls. But it's a distraction for the entire Republican Party and thinks he needs to step aside. But Asa Hutchinson, as well as saying this to ABC News over the weekend, he'll have this formal announcement in April. He's polling at maybe 1%. So this is just becoming a why It's going to become a much wider race. But yeah, but the fact is, I saw over the weekend, Anne-Marie, that the former president of the United States has bang-up polls. Am I wrong on that? He has fantastic polling numbers, and also he has fantastic donation numbers. More than $4 million, his campaign says he was able to bring in since the indictment was announced in 24 hours. And more interesting part of those numbers, they say 25% was brand new individuals. Can he use that to pay his legal bills? He's using it for his campaign. That's what he's using it for. This is this is the notice his campaign sent us. I think also interesting, there was a poll over the weekend from ABC and, and uh, Ipsos that shows that a plurality of Americans think that the former president should have been indicted. It was correct what the Manhattan DA do. But a similar number also think that this is political. And that's what the former president and Republicans writ large are going to be leaning into. <clears throat> was that enough indictment talk? Well, I just, I, every time that I hear it, I'm just thinking, other than a continuation <clears throat> of the Trump show with people basically, uh, you know, split on both sides of the, of the debate, what have we learned? What's the policy implication? Is there anything, or is this basically just a continuation of the reality television show of his presidency? Yeah, I think this morning it was called a circus by your very own Greg Vallier, who's on the show a lot. Mm -hmm. This, there's going to be no policy implications except for the fact that it's going to be very difficult for leaders to not be asked about this instead of policy well, questions. So that's then, kind of my implication. Okay. That's kind of how I view it. So then let's get to the policy because there are a couple of pretty major things that are going on, not least of which is some of the questions about journalistic freedom over in Russia. I'm going to table that for a second. The administration's response to what we saw from OPEC Plus basically thumbing their nose at uh, the administration saying, we want prices higher. We don't care if you want them lower. Do they have any ammunition left to really empty their strategic petroleum reserve further or even uh, engage in any level? They do, but it'll be difficult because remember they've depleted it so much in these historic releases over the course of the past year as they wanted to get gasoline prices down and of course as Putin has waged war in Ukraine that we saw a spike in prices. This was their biggest response, making sure they can tap the SPR. So it'll be very difficult for them to do that now, especially as they want to replenish it. We were going towards a level of prices around $70 a barrel that if that was, be able, if that was going to be maintained, they could potentially step in and do that. Now what you have is a very difficult position because at some point, this cut from OPEC plus, including 500,000 barrels from Saudi Arabia, this is going to at some point hit gasoline prices, and that will impact inflation. Which is really especially problematic because we heard from Energy Secretary Granholm, I believe last week or a couple weeks ago, that now it's off the table to replenish the SPR because of the price Well, you cannot replenish there. if you are also tapping it. You, it's one way or the other. You, if you're going to tap the strategic petroleum well, reserve and let it, and let oil out, or you replenish okay. it, but you're not going to do the same. I okay. have the same at the same time. Lisa, amateur. Tom Keen, amateur. Even you, with all of your wonderful reporting in Washington, amateur. Ed Morris of Citigroup was just scathing about the lack lack of market knowledge of the Biden administration. Are they just a bunch of academics down at 1600 Pennsylvania I, Avenue? I don't. Think or does anybody understand? There's a bid and ask on Brent. I, I don't think that would be fair. There is a huge Department of Energy. Um, Biden has a number of key energy advisors around him, one of them being Amos Hochstein, who joins Bloomberg a lot, who has worked in the energy industry. 
the, I think the past year or two has been unprecedented times in the in the oil market. And obviously, <clears throat> when you're looking at what's going on today, this is because of OPEC Plus's move. And you look at what's going right. on in Saudi Arabia. So much of this is not just higher. They want higher prices. But also, this is a country that's dealing with the collapse of Credit Suisse, which they had a huge stake in. For those of you worldwide, we are going to digress now. Lisa Abramowitz is going to lead a discussion with Anne-Marie Hardern, who has walked the streets of Moscow. Often. Well, we heard about uh, this 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 discussion that Blinken had with Ant uh, Anthony Blinken had Mr. with Lavrov, Lavrov Sergey yeah. Lavrov, saying this is really serious. You cannot take just journalists off the street. And now there's reporting about you know people being stripped of their visas mm -hmm. to keep them in Russia. What is the U.S. administration able to do to really get the Wall Street Journal reporter back to try to loosen the ties at a time when they are hardening and you're seeing the first journalist abduction, basically, going back to the Cold War? So I think one thing we need to remember, and the Wall Street Journal editor-in-chief was on Face the Nation this weekend and said there's still so many questions that we have. They think where he's being held, but they're not 100 percent sure. He has not had access, as Evan Gershovich had not had access to his lawyer. He's a 31-year-old Wall Street Journal reporter. He's an American citizen. And that is why this phone call this weekend was so rare. We do not see Secretary Blinken picking up the phone, speaking to his counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, because of this war that's happening. So clearly, this is key for the U.S. administration and top of mind. We don't know what's going on exactly behind the scenes, but the fact that a phone call was made, very serious, that they want this individual back. There's sort of a, a difficult game theory going on where if you negotiate and you pony up some kind of uh, sweetener to get back prisoners, there is an incentive to just to get take more, more prisoners. How much are people talking about that in this instance? People are, people are talking about this because they do think it is a concern that Russia will now just go after, find reasons to go after either more U.S. journalists that they can get their hands on, anyone that the U.S. would deem important and critical they want to get back. Emory Horton, thank you so much. Our chief Washington correspondent, of course, very busy with balance of power, looking towards, I believe, tomorrow. We saw earlier in the last hour the former president's private uh, jet, private plane on the runway, I believe, in Florida, and we'll have to see what his one. travel plans are. What do you call it? Trump Force One is what he calls it. He calls it Trump Force One. Yeah. Okay. Does Pharaoh have the golf stream today? I think so. You know. Well, you sent him off to about four <clears throat> different places in the past two no, hours. No, he's in so Australia like for the Grand be. Prix. It's a long way back. They got to stop to refuel also, a couple times. Didn't you also say Detroit on some sort of, sort of uh, pitch no, he, campaign? No, for that's his scheduled latest. for this week. Uh. He's got his March 31 year ahead. It's nine month year ahead, <laughs> and he does a road show across America. That he's writing you know. the March 31st outlook yeah. on April 3rd, which is what we all kind of want yeah. to do, given the fact that it switches <laughs> so quickly. Right now, what I am seeing in the market is uh, people perhaps not getting history about this oil move, but nonetheless, well really uh, yes. kind of framing yes. a new worry out there. I don't think that we can say that it's suddenly changing the narrative, but it's definitely casting a pall over the sort of disinflationary, uh, I guess, hope that people were having last and week. And the shock you see, you see it in strong Mexican peso. I spent a good part of the morning looking at the oddity of Mexican peso. I'm not used to this number under 18 pesos. It was 21, 22 uh, during Mexican angst of a couple years ago, and we've seen a stronger Mexican peso, 70.9. Some of that's oil influenced uh, as well. We'll have to see what Canada's doing this morning uh, as we move forward. Coming up, this is on the equity market. You didn't have the courage to be in. Maybe you need to find a trend, and that is the true expertise of Katie Kaminsky. She's chief research strategist, Alpha Simplex. Really, really enjoyed talking to her. Must watch, must listen for Global Wall Street. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlitz, and Tom Key. Mr. Farrell on assignment uh, here uh, this morning. The two of us trying to get us open for the second quarter. Of this year, red and green on the screen, a churn to the market. Everybody watching, oil 84 to 68. Let's dash to it with somewhat of a truncated data check. Is Lisa Bramowitz 
looks at big oil. Well, I want to understand the, what the read-through is. I mean, everyone's been bullish on big oil, and it hasn't necessarily been lifted, certainly Q1 by oil Q1 was prices. a challenge. Q1 was a challenge, and yeah. a lot of people thought this was going to be the key inflation hedge. Today, perhaps uh, reprising that bet, you're seeing Exxon shares, Chevron shares, and Shell shares all uh, higher by more than 4% on this hope that perhaps OPEC Plus cutting, uh, cutting production by more than a million barrels will support oil prices over the longer term. I find this interesting. I want to know exactly how elastic this is, if Ed Morris is correct, that perhaps the lack of demand and the dampening of demand will offset this. We'll see how that plays out in some of these stocks. I'm also watching Tesla. And this was a really interesting kind of dynamic. <clears throat> announcing Help over me with the this. Weekend, I miss this. Announcing over the weekend a record quarter of vehicle deliveries, basically saying after they cut their prices <clears throat> by about uh, as much as 20 percent for the Model Y uh, uh, the in rendition, that they sold lots more, they delivered lots more, the shares are lower. Why, right? Down 2.3%. Some saying that they didn't reach Elon mm -hmm. Musk's prognostications about how much he was going to put out there, the deliveries that he thought he was going to say. But this, to me, a Jeffries analyst said this that I thought was really interesting. Continued excess production over deliveries will keep the debate going on price elasticity versus general demand weakness. If you have to cut prices in order to generate the same kind of deliveries and sales, what does that mean <laughs> with respect to margins? What does does that mean in terms of the overall outlook for your company? Absolutely brilliant. And it comes to this word that I use a lot, ambiguity, and that you get the – There's, I'm sorry, a price cut is not a free lunch. It's not a it's not a path, immediate path to success, and that's some of the ambiguous trends you see in Tesla. Well, and although on the flip side, people say, well, he got greedy. A lot of the margins were so big that if you reduce them a little I, bit, you can generate the revenues. Right now, mm, the market perhaps is saying that some of those hopes I, I, are overplayed. I'm looking at Tesla's 14 new electric vehicles are coming to market, and some of them are from huge, small car, lower price players. He's got real competition coming into next year and the it, year following. And you're talking about from the U.S. with respect mm. to some of the, the Detroit big three, but you're also talking about China yeah, and what we're seeing China, from there. That probably Japan, is even bigger what else uh, bigger have? competition. That's it. That's all I was looking at That's today. That's it? Okay. There was well, Micron. A, we could go April further. Fools. I but thought those it was 14 ones. stocks. I can keep going if you want to. No, I think we can leave it there. Dan Ives with that price target lift on Apple. I guess that's, that's something to talk about here as movers. Every I'll morning you want that. me to put Apple in my movers. Well, who doesn't? Do know that? Let's start with okay, that. Okay, fine. Mean, Katie but it's owns down it. less than five tenths of a percent. <clears throat> okay. It's not the main story of the day. Well, okay, but to Dan Ives, it is. We'll have to leave it there. Red and green on the screen. And right now, this is really important for Global Wall Street because at Alpha Simplex, they really, really stay on trend and trend dynamics. And why is this important? Sometimes a trend is your friend, but what's really important here. In the last 90 days, a trend has not been your friend. We've been range-bound. We've been collared. The word I use amateurly is soup. We've had lots of technical soup. Katie Kaminsky joins Chief Research Strategist at Alpha Simplex. Katie, to look back, why was the last 90 days so challenging for those that want to get on a trend? Yes. I mean, we've had one of the biggest trend environments in years. It was one of the best years for trend that you can imagine. And that was really shorting bonds and also being long commodities in, in the first half of the year and also long the dollar. A lot of these trends are really focused on the rising rates uh, narrative and Fed policy. As that is shifting, we're actually talking more about consolidation and how much inflation tolerance is going to be the new trend in 2023. What is the trend for the second quarter and into the rest of the year? What's the identifiable bet you can make? So I think the one that people will underestimate the most is fixed income. If things are better, if we've actually seen an environment where this banking crisis issue is is stabilizing and we're seeing a Fed that's stepping back a little bit, then we're going to see a situation of inflation tolerance. In that case, we're going to start seeing signs that this has to give somewhere. My view is the end of the yield curve. Long-term bonds could still be a short signal this year, and you could also see commodities coming back later in the year as well as inflation continues to be sticky. This is an important point, Katie, especially because a lot of people are sort of quietly gaming out a greater reluctance to hike rates or even to avoid cutting rates in the face of unemployment that truly is rising. How much do you see that resurgent inflation expectation over the longer term as a result? I mean, what are you gaming out in your head? 
Well, I think for us, what's interesting is the technical signals on equities have stayed somewhat positive this year versus last year. You've also seen short signals still hanging around, even though they definitely took a hit in Q1. So I think short bonds, long equities with a little bit of skepticism, but also the potential for resurgence in commodities, depending on how equities do, because equities have really been driving how commodities have performed earlier this year, and commodities have been a little bit more uh, taken a backseat compared to equities. Look at the worst performing asset year to date until now, it's crude. Um, there's a good example of, of a potential change in direction. Well, yeah, I was going to say, perhaps that changed overnight. I'm wondering how much of a game changer you see the OPEC decision to cut by uh, more than a million barrels their production. So I think the OPEC decision is more like a catalyst on top of something that's already moving the other direction. Uh, we saw really a bottoming of oil prices. We also see as inflation tolerance becomes the narrative that there's some, you know, headwind tailwinds for um, energy prices. But you also see the right. fact that as things look better, there's going to be better demand. So, you know, you're kind of seeing the, the cuts as something that's kind of accelerated a move recently. Katie, I've been using recently a lot of the fancy technical stuff that you and Elf Simplex live on, things that Wells Wilder came up with 30 and 40 years ago. How do you know when to get out of an equity trend? If I throw around phrases like parabolic SAR or ADX DMI and the rest of the mumbo jumbo, folks, they have incense, they burn there. They go down to the Charles River in front of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They sing Kumbaya. Great. How do I know when to get out of Apple? Well, I mean, that's a good, that's the, the you know, million dollar question. And I think what trend followers we try to do is see some confirmatory evidence that a trend is breaking down. One of the biggest areas to find that is <clears throat> volatility. As volatility spikes, you see that sort of people are uncertain about where things are going. So it's really a function of how much things have moved relative to how uncertain they are, which really determines how much the trend, uh, how much of the trend is still actually profitable or potentially uh, useful. Well, where's the equity trend right now? I mean, is there any value for Alpha Simplex to look at any of the major indices? I mean, is there is is the Nasdaq 100 storytelling right now? So we're seeing, on average, positive signals in equities that sort of have persisted past this recent event. So that's, in some sense, a suggestion that the market is seeing stabilization um, in terms of what it, we just endured in Q1. So I'd say that the outlook is optimistic, but a little bit cautious. Just ask her about the triple leverage don't catch fun. I heard a birdie in my head, and I'm going to ignore it. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But to me, uh, we, we are encroaching on the second quarter at a time where a lot of people have been flipping and flopping with all of their narratives. I want to ask everybody this. What has changed for you this quarter from last quarter? What changed for me is we finally saw a potential bottom in that bear market trend for fixed income. The fact that we actually saw the ramifications of what happened in monetary policy last year and that the narrative is changing and that the new narrative is about how much inflation will we tolerate is what has changed for me this year. Katie, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. Katie Kaminsky there, just really, really brilliant with Alpha Simplex. I can't, I mean, you, you, you know, folks, I mean, anybody that's watching this show day after day, my deepest sympathies for starts. But, you know, Chris Verone, Katie Kaminsky, these people are on trend. I'm not a big believer in stochastics, jumpy, jumpy, trying to catch a knife in the dark, buy it here. I'm much more comfortable with the trend base. And to me, and this is important, if I bring up the Bloomberg Total Return Bond Index, it has an equity characteristic to it of bouncing. You know, it didn't bounce off the Ankenpore October low. Well, it was like 10 days later, bond prices lifted up. And now it's a huge what if. I mean, uh, it's it, in some ways it's technically elegant, uh, and in other ways maybe I'm you know a little nervous here. But she's saying bonds are correlating with that equity lift. Once upon a time, people thought of credit as sort of the smart asset class that had sort of a tea leaf type of characteristic that could give you a look forward. That was sort of the crystal ball for where equities were going. Now they're trading in tandem. And there really isn't necessarily a, a greater signal from one than another. Uh, some people would say that credit has performed pretty much bang on in line with equities with respect to what credit spreads are doing. And perhaps it's because corporate 
uh, balance sheets have been so much better and they have they don't have maturities coming anytime soon. So this is the difficulty. How do you follow a trend when the trend is jumping all over the place and nobody can really get a signal versus a noise? It's real simple. You've got up what, up 20 percent, whatever people are talking about, an end of the bear market in NASDAQ 100. We'll bring it over to stodgy bonds. Bring it over to the land of Bramo, as they say. And I'm sorry, Bloomberg all in total return is up 8 percent ish. Don't quote me on that, folks. I'm doing it in real time here. Hold my tang in my hand. But the answer is we're up like 8% in price. Is that a bull market in bonds? It's Come on, it's two years coupon. Well, I mean, this is definitely what some people are saying. You've seen a number of days of pretty steady gains in uh, high-yield bonds even. You're seeing markets kind of maybe start to open up, but the primary market is still kind of rusty. I don't know. You asked a question earlier. You said everybody owns Apple, so you should be focused on Apple every day and really give a sense of where it is. There is a big question facing us in the second quarter hinged to Apple, which is can we see big tech reassert its leadership over the index the way that it did over the first quarter? Was that... Uh, simply a departure from the new trend, or is that Boy, going is that to be an example? Debate. Heated, Heated debate. Heated debate, and it's yeah. underpinning a lot of the calls that we hear on the bulls and the <clears throat> bears as they line up heading and into the rest of the year. The other debate here on April 2-3, whatever the date is, is I'm sorry, the angst of five days ago, deposit flow analysis, that seemed to evaporate over the weekend. The fact that we've gotten three straight weekends without a bank failure is a trend. And I think people are basically clinging to that for uh, some sense of optimism, but not unbridled optimism. Because I think that really what we heard uh, from a number of our guests, restraining lending uh, standards, the fact that you're going to get this restraint in credit is going to be an issue. But we're not seeing it really priced in yet. This is really, to me, when do we start to see the uh, the true ramifications of that? Well, we're going to have to see. I mean, that's all there is. Uh, that's all there is to it. I want to make a program note here. Bloomberg surveillance in its many guises out on YouTube, which is sort of interesting. We're really beginning to build this out as well. It's like my project for 2023. Bramo on YouTube. It's gonna be it's gonna be good. You can see the Bramo, the Bramo channel. Red and green on the screen, SP negative six. This is Bloomberg. And I'll be our first subscriber. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, a surprising move from OPEC Plus as the coalition makes an oil production cut of more than 1 million barrels a day. Oil futures soared following the new inflation risk. Saudi Arabia led the cartel by pledging its own 500,000 barrel a day supply reduction. The White House said the cutbacks were ill-advised. That Chinese spy balloon that floated over the U.S. in February reportedly gathered intelligence from several military sites. According to NBC News, the intelligence that was collected was mostly from electronic signals rather than images. The U.S. shot the balloon down off the coast of South Carolina. The debris that was recovered is still being analyzed. Former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson is re-entering the race for the Republican nomination for president. Hutchinson has been critical of the former President Trump. He told ABC that people want leaders that appeal to the best of America and not simply appeal to the worst instincts. McDonald's is reportedly temporarily closing its U.S. offices this week while it prepares for corporate layoffs. According to The Wall Street Journal, the company told U.S. employees and some international staff to work from home through Wednesday so it can deliver layoff decisions virtually. The cuts are part of a restructuring plan. And in sports, LSU is a new champion of women's college basketball. The Tigers beat Iowa 102-85 to win the NCAA title in Dallas. LSU's Angel Reese had 15 points and 10 rebounds and was named the most outstanding player. It was Coach Kim Mulkey's fourth national title. She won three others at Baylor. For Iowa, Caitlin Clark had 30 points. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Is another bank going to fail? Probably not at this point. Is there going to be another hemorrhage? Hopefully not. But is the public going to slow down? Are they going to say, uh, I'm fine with two basis points, literally, at my Chase account, and I'll just leave my money there? No, they're not going to do that either. So the flow, I think, away from the low-yielding bank deposits to high-yielding alternatives will continue, and that will continue to pressure banks.
Jim Bianco of Bianco Research joining us in the studio after the Quinnipiac Game Forum uh, there. I, I'm not going to mince words. I put out a banner, Elon Musk. Uh, what did I say? Elon Musk is something James Bianco. And somebody said, well, why are you doing that? And I said, Jim Bianco is everything Twitter is supposed to be. He has had more impact on Twitter than anyone in this banking crisis I can think of, putting out intelligent short threads that are thought per Provoking, and I, you know, he's a guy. Elon Musk. Elon Musk should have him out to San Francisco for a cup of coffee. Did you see that uh, Elon Musk yeah. removed New York Times blue check? Over no, the I didn't see that. There's been a big debate <clears throat> over how they're going to do this. Are we going to lose verified. ours? It's a great question. I don't have I don't any know. proprietary knowledge over it, but there is yeah. an issue that he has where he cut the valuation by half. How do you generate income at a time where you do depend on the Jim Biancos to provide that uh, sort of uh, interesting and well, valuable content for free? We've been bank free here this morning. I haven't even looked at the pre-market on uh, FRC. Let me do that quickly before we get to our... Uh, wonderful guest here. You can do this on the Bloomberg Terminal, folks. FRC, well, it's a churning, I'm going to call it, 13.94 on uh, First Republic here. Uh, and that's, of course, still substantially down. And, you know, you look at a regular chart of FRC and it's uh, flatlining. Maybe that's what American banking is doing. What, the bank bank crisis is over? Well, this is the issue, right? <clears throat> if the bank crisis is over, are some of the concerns about tightening lending conditions really over as well, or does that just sort of harden the lines again? Basically, think, are we changing the narrative, or are we just building on the narrative no, that do, people already had faith in? Do we agree that the recalibrate here at the beginning of the second quarter is a lot of people, including David Kelly at J.P. Morgan, looking for some real restriction from credit decision-making? Yeah, I think yeah. a lot of people are looking for that. Yeah. Right now, what we're going to do is look at another bank crisis. This is a crisis of the Swiss people with their banks. There used to be three big banks, and then SBC bought UBS, but they named it UBS, and there was the Upstart Credit Suisse. This is 30, 40 years ago. It's history, and it's a history that Jan Patrick Barnett knows in Frankfurt, who's really been wonderful giving us guidance uh, here. The headline, Jan Patrick, is great. It's not a shock to me. They're going to eliminate 30% of whatever in the merger as well. But give us an update on the outrage of the Swiss people. Can the Swiss people tell the elites what to do? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a big question. And we had another headline today that goes into that direction where you had Swiss prosecutors looking into the deal if there was any wrongdoing inside, uh, on the side of uh, the government officials or Credit Suisse uh, managers or UBS managers or whatsoever. <laughs> and that uh, that tells you a lot that there's a lot of scrutiny, there's a lot of focus on on that deal. Um, I'm not so sure if the, the wider public, besides the fact that they probably appreciate that there was no breakdown in the financial system again, um, that they really are like right. on board with that, with that merger going forward. So a lot of focus, a lot of scrutiny, and that leads to that deal. Uh, it has right. very little margin of error. In a crisis a million years ago, at the beginning of the United States Depression, Jan Patrick, FDR took over, and literally that evening, he and Herbert Hoover put their desks together to begin to solve America's depression problem. What are Credit Suisse and UBS officers doing? Are they putting their desks together in one office? Are they on speaking terms? What are they actually doing on this Monday in Zurich? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I guess, like, it's kind of friendly, but it's not like that this is a merger of equal, even though uh, Credit Suisse likes to play that uh, down that that story uh, that, that way sometimes. Uh, UBS is in the driver's seat here. Um, they are also responsible to make this merger work. Uh, so I guess they will tell uh, Credit Suisse employees and managers what, what is next and what to do. Of course, to make this thing work, you, you don't want to have, like, enemies on the other side. So you have to somewhat... Uh, work together and, and and figure out a common ground and say, OK, uh, we have to do this now. We are all in the same boat. We have to make this new bank work in whatever way. And so everybody, the bank managers, the employees, the clients, the public, the politicians, they all need to find some common ground that will take some time. Um, but uh, it's not an easy one, but I think it's possible. Execution risk. I was reading about this over the weekend and what that means when it comes to cutting more than 30,000 jobs worldwide, about 30 percent of the workforce combined of UBS and Credit Suisse. How does this combined entity led by UBS retain the talent that they could be acquiring from Credit Suisse as they announce a round of cuts and they do have that imbalance that you talk about with UBS leading the charge? 
that, that's going to be a very narrow path that they have to wander along. Of course, they will need some more people for the bigger entity. That's that's for sure. And if you have talent, and I'm sure there is in at Credit Suisse, you want to talk to them and and see like, okay, how can we keep you on board, and how can we fit you into the new new uh, bigger picture? Um, but overall, it's 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 a very difficult thing to to keep everybody happy here, as I, as I said earlier, because it's a mega merger on paper. There's lots of operations. There's lots of risk involved. Uh, lots of uh, people want to have a say in it. Politicians, managers. Uh, the people, everyone. Um, so, and and you have not much time. We have the AGM from Credit Suisse tomorrow. UBS is on Wednesday. Earnings later this month. So, I guess they have to come up with some ideas uh, pretty fast. How much government involvement is there, Jan Patrick? Especially given this investigation, which we don't really understand in terms of what it's looking at. Well, I guess there's a lot of government uh, involvement, even though they don't tell us this uh, exactly. But there's lots of money that the government uh, put in there. The government orchestrated this uh, this deal, so they're kind of responsible for it to work. And you could see it already with the the, the old CEO being now the new CEO that this was kind of uh, a wish from the government side that they said like we want to have someone here in charge who can uh, make this work because like if this thing goes wrong, you know, in in whatever way. Um, I mean, this this is the stuff that brings governments down, right? So, uh, and right. I guess the Swiss uh, top officials know this, and they want to make it work. Yeah, Patrick, you just nailed the emotion that I have seen since the great financial crisis. And I don't mean to cast aspersion on anybody, including the Swiss government and these two major banks. You said that's the keeping of everyone happy. Since when, under Schumpeterian creative destruction, are we supposed to, quote, unquote, keep everyone happy. How did we get here, Jan Patrick? Well, that, that that is very difficult. And um, if you put it like that, I would say it's probably also impossible that everybody is really happy. But I mean, it's um, it's a merger that was necessary at the end, not for the for the good reasons, but for the bad ones. So now they have to make it work. And I believe if there are sensible people at work on on both sides and with the politicians, and if also the public um, can appreciate the effort that is that is now being done, if if everybody tones down a little bit the own personal interest for the greater good that we have a still stable banking system here in Europe and that the situation of credit, which is not two weeks old, but two years old, is now solved and hopefully for the better, um, then I think this this can be done. But in the end, it's people uh, and emotions are high, as always, and you never know. I'm, I'm pretty sure this won't be the last Monday that we're talking to each other about credit Suisse headlines. Yeah, and Patrick, I'm also thinking about some of the other banks that are swooping in like vultures to attack and get any of the potential talent away from Credit Suisse before the merger really is completed. How much are you hearing about that kind of activity? Uh, well, not too much. And I think like other banks are more in a wait and see uh, mode at this point and, and looking how is this going to play out. This is also this could end up to be a blueprint for, for Europe as well. Europe has been struggling to really pull off big banking mergers, uh, especially cross border. This is a domestic one, fair enough. Uh, but still, I think like every bank is like looking here and, and thinking, OK, if this if this is going to be successful, then this could put has the potential to change the European banking landscape for good. And then we would probably see more mergers and more consolidation, <coughs> uh, which is I guess, good for the system overall, um, not so good for the drop market, I guess. Jan Patrick, in your afternoon, thank you so much. Jan Patrick Barnett with us here with this real banking knowledge here of working for many European banks before working and leading our coverage at Bloomberg uh, News. I don't know what to make about this other than I take immense issue with you can lay off 30 percent and keep everyone happy. I just this whole we are the world this and this started you know, in 2007, 8, 9 as well, everybody's going to be happy. Baloney. I just don't buy it. Well, and that's the reason why execution risk means how do you keep the good and get rid of the bad and keep a functional <clears throat> and, bank without necessarily, uh, you know, completely hammering morale on all sides. Christiane Lucchese writing for uh, Bloomberg on UBS. The headline, UBS deal to unseat J.P. Morgan is top Latin America wealth manager. You don't think Fortress Diamond's going to respond to that? Pretty much you're hearing about it from every single major bank. I they mean, are all scouring. Jamie Diamond's going to get on the phone. He's going to call up David Kelly and all the wealth managers. That's what the headline says. And he say, get on the airplane and go to South America. Absolutely. That's what's going to happen. And why wouldn't they go if they're not promised a real trajectory, a real path? It's all moved so quickly. How can they get it it's together? It's just amazing. I mean, they're, they're probably going to live on the airplanes and never be home. I mean, there it is. UBS deal to unseat J.P. Morgan as top Latin American wealth manager. Stay with us, red and green on the screen. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. The 
Fed's process of raising rates so aggressively is having an effect in the real economy. As long as capital markets are able to keep the money flows coming, we won't have a crashing kind of effect on the U.S. economy. I do think you have some evidence of slowing in the economy. We don't think inflation is stabilizing anywhere close to what the Fed cares about, too. If the economy does take a dive, they'll have to respond to it. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. A new quarter, a new narrative, perhaps. We shall see. Oil front and center from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, John Farrow off today. And I do think we've got to focus on oil and question whether this really does change the narrative in a meaningful way heading into this new quarter. And lifting through the morning here, we've got a solid 85 print on Brent crude right now. The, the, the narrative going into the morning is a lift up here uh, as we talked to Ed Morris recently. And, and I'm sorry, it still comes with all the Persian golfness of this OPEC plus announcement. It still comes back to the demand guesstimate that we all have. So here's the tension. Is oil disinflationary? Oil prices going <clears throat> higher. Is that disinflationary or inflationary? Do we end up with Riyadh cutting production by 500,000 barrels uh, in the OPEC plus complex by more than a million? Is that going to ultimately cause prices to go higher in the face of demand that is continuing to be sustained? Because we haven't seen a massive drop off just yet. Yeah, Ed Morris divides it between west of Suez and east of Suez. I went with my questioning to him uh, to east of Suez, which is the Hormuz Strait, and then over to the Straits of Malacca off Singapore as well. This announcement, you know, we're in America, we're like, yeah, you know, what's it mean for a gallon of gas? This announcement east of the Suez is a huge deal. Right now, OPEC Plus is having their meeting, and the fact that they announced this before the meeting was really telling because they were not expected to yeah. make any change in output for them to cut so significantly it was really dramatic. At this moment, when you talk about is demand going to decline in tandem with the decline in oil production, that's really also the tension underpinning a lot of the calls. People who believe <clears throat> the consumer has sustained ability to keep spending and then to offset any potential uh, you know, decline that you're seeing with respect to lending and some of these other issues. Right. And those who say the world <clears throat> has changed. Oh, the world has changed. And you know, we're going to follow the headlines here this morning. In Are they in Vienna for this meeting? It's remote. It's remote. It's virtual. How, that's, come on. we got to go to Vienna someday. The You're, three of us there. <laughs> that's the real reason why you wanted to not be uh, no, remote, right? No, but it, it seems like Vienna's fun. Anne Marie goes, Manus goes, you know, why don't we ever go to Vienna? You want to Like an OPEC trip? meeting, okay. a road trip. All right. It'll be good. What I want to do is get a bond brief here because Tony Rodriguez is coming up. Lisa, help me um, here. He's writing up spreads here. In the banking crisis, in I guess the sigh of relief over the last five days, have high yields bettered? Is it price up, yield down of high yields as compared to uh, full faith and credit? Yeah. I mean, you've seen uh, some some credit spread retracement. You've seen uh, spreads go from as high as five, uh, almost 5.2 <clears throat> percentage points over benchmark rates down to about four and a half percentage points over benchmark rates. Still not retracing all of the gains or at least, uh, you know, higher spreads, lower price, not retracing all of the price losses. Still question, does this matter? Because there is a difference between market pricing and the ability to actually get credit. And people are not really selling junk bonds in the market right now. It's not a very open capital market, a little bit around the edges, but not to the same kind of degree. Let's do a data check right now. Reading, I mean, what, what do you see, Lisa? I mean, I, you know, the, I, are we going to Jobs Day on Friday with some, you know, fairly amount of economic data today? I mean, this week, rather. But I don't have much of a data check. As you mentioned, Brent crude was an 84, now $85. 10 cents a barrel, up 6.5%. I think you're seeing NASDAQ right now. To me, I'm watching this uh, near session lows down <clears throat> 7 tenths of a percent. And this, to me, is going to be interesting. Boom. Do right. we just I mean, go look, up again? It's very difficult to say anything <clears throat> based on a moment's pricing, especially in this market. But to me, the corollary between suddenly yields higher, tech lower, continues this relationship that really has been called into question by a lot of fundamental investors. Does the fact yes. that we could see higher yields really potentially threaten tech? And on the flip side, lower yields, does that really act as a support of big tech at a time when valuations have already kind of shifted away from Fed policy? I look at dollar euro. I look at dollar, I should say, I look at euro dollar, I look at dollar yen, you triangulate to euro yen, and I'm out strong euro weak yen, but not through resistance. Again, as, as we heard from Katie Kaminsky, there's so many things 
within a band, within a collar right now where you haven't really broken out strong here a week yet. How do you follow a trend in a trendless <clears throat> market? Exactly. How it's very existential of you. This yeah. is a very existential market, especially because a lot of people feel like we're... What we're, you say? Well, <laughs> How do you follow a trendless market? How do you follow the trend in a trendless market? Because we really haven't gotten any clarity. And I think I, that that just continues in the soup of, <clears throat> you know, is an OPEC cut in production right. actually going to lead to even lower oil prices, like Ed Morris was saying, because what you could get is just even further uh, demand destruction. Let's dive into it now with someone rewriting history after 90 days of 2023. Tony Rodriguez is head of fixed income strategy at Novena and joins us this morning. Tony, I want to drill right into your wheelhouse and to me, one of the hallmarks of the month of March was the United Healthcare gazillion dollar bond issuance. It was hugely oversubscribed. So investment grade corporate bonds go down in price, up in yield. The so-called spread widens out. And then what? What is the then what for comfortable investment grade bonds over the next 90 days? Well, good morning, Tom. Good to be with you. Um, I think you bring up a good point that what we have seen with this uh, widening in spreads that we saw kind of over the first quarter is that the appetite for high quality, attractive yielding debt is still quite high in the marketplace. Supply, as Lisa had mentioned earlier, <clears throat> has been limited, particularly in the high yield market where it's been very quiet. But even in the investment grade market, while it's open, supply is down from last year. Yet demand for, again, high income earning assets when the equity markets are clearly you know, volatile and many view, the, view it as relatively risky, the investment grade, right. high quality yield available is really attractive to investors today. For example, Lisa, United Healthcare, Dow Jones stock, 11.2% is their weight of debt. Apple loaded with debt, I say, 5.1% of debt. I mean, that's the, the, the idiocy of these hugely profitable companies. Do they want to take out debt and solidify <clears throat> rates where they are, or do they want to wait for a better entry point? Tony, is your sense that the pipeline is building as companies try to immunize potential borrowing costs even at higher rates? Yeah, we do think that there's going to be reasonable demand, and that's because while we expect rates to decline somewhat between here and the end of the year, we're not expecting a dramatic move. So really, companies are not going to be waiting for dramatically lower levels. And so when liquidity is available, what companies have learned is certainly to take advantage of that. And we do think that demand is going to be relatively healthy throughout the month of April, and we're expecting supply to recover, given that March saw a little bit of a suppression, obviously, given all the noise and uncertainty uh, around the financial sector and broader implications. So you think that right now uh, credit spreads are pricing in the potential weakness that some people are seeing economically that will come later this year? Well, we're expecting to see some widening here between now and over the next call of one to two quarters because we're expecting to see some economic weakness as we move into the second half of the year. So our view is that we could retrace to some of the wides that we saw last September you saw that the investment grade market and the double B market, for example, how you actually did that. Lower quality didn't quite do it. We've now recovered because obviously the most severe stresses from the financial uh, sector have moderated quite a bit. But we do think you'll see some noise over the next couple of quarters. There could be some better entry <clears throat> points. But largely, we do think investors are being pretty well compensated in the high grade space and in the high quality right. segments of below investment grade. And now, folks, it's time for the dumb surveillance question of the day. It's a special feature we have, which I always lead. Tony Rodriguez, do bond markets have bear and bull markets? Like, can I say on price, we've had a bear market in bonds, and then price is going to go up, yield's going to go down, and so that's a bull market in bonds? Do you guys think that way? Well, certainly they do have bull and bear markets. Our view is that what we're actually going to be seeing here is a range-bound market. So we're going to, we've seen a nice little rally in the two-year, for example, from 5% to now just above 4 Again, we could see some retracement, but we're thinking a fairly range-bound rates market, and by the end of the year, you should see lower yields. So we'll call that a bond mini bull market.
There, there, did you hear that reach by Nuveen there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can we quote Rodriguez on that? It's a bond mini bull market. Tony Rodriguez, thank you so much. See how he did that? <laughs> Equity. You, could you see Liz Ann Saunders? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bull bond. It's a bull stock mini, mini. It's a muddle. I think that it's fair for us to say. I mean, that's kind of what we're hearing from everyone. How do you characterize something that's not going to be dreadful? Uh, it won't be absolutely amazing, but it will muddle through. And it'll provide some risk and, and reward and this idea of, of income at a time right. when finally it's available. I mean, the Bramo cram has is, cram is, is caught some of your gloom here this morning. But what's your level of gloom after the 90-day surreal? I mean, I mean, let's all agree the first quarter was surreal. I mean, did we think Credit Suisse was not going to be around on April 3rd? I don't think so. I thought it was going to be here. I'm not sure whether Credit Suisse neatly <clears throat> falls into the whole narrative because they had a lot of issues yes. uh, to start with. It wasn't exactly the deposit mismatch and such of Silicon Valley Bank. You know, I don't know what to make of the first quarter. I'm not sure. I feel that as if we're on a tipping point and everyone keeps saying the economic data isn't reflecting the changes that are being made on the margins in terms of confidence and in terms of some of the weakness. And on the flip side, other people say, well, things still have been coming out good. You actually take a look at the yeah. surprise index, and it's the economic surprises have been to the upside. So I don't know what to make of it, to be honest. And I think that nobody else does either, which is the reason why there's been this muddle, this lack of conviction, this mini bull market maybe, and you'll keep getting well, income. We're going to be smarter Friday at 8.30. I'm going to go all John Farrow on you right now. Thank ISM, you. 10 a.m. Thank you. Farrow would be all over this. He'd be like lathering up ISM manufacturing prices pay that'll clearly be important looking for a little bit of an ebbing on the survey of ism was that fair enough that Did was I do that Edge of of i him. think so <laughs> ism the first good look at the april uh, data that on the way to the jobs report on friday in the eight o'clock hour we're in it right now coming up michael mckee in conversation with the controversial james bullard of the st louis fed we'll do that in 15 minutes must watch must listen for Global Wall Street. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The price of oil jumped today after OPEC Plus announced a surprise production cut of more than 1 million barrels a day. The coalition abandoned previous assurances that it would hold supply steady. Saudi Arabia led the cartel by pledging its own 500,000 barrel a day reduction. The White House calls the cutback ill-advised. Entertainment conglomerate Endeavor has agreed to buy World Wrestling Entertainment in a deal worth an enterprise value of about $9.3 billion. The company will be led by Endeavor. Reportedly will cut its workforce by up to 30 percent after completing the takeover of Credit Suisse. That's according to a Swiss newspaper. The paper said that as many as 11,000 employees will be laid off in Switzerland and another 25,000 worldwide. Meanwhile, Swiss prosecutors are gathering evidence as part of a possible criminal investigation into the deal. And Donald Trump's lawyer says he'll plead not guilty when he appears in court in Manhattan on Tuesday. The former president will also look to have the case dismissed. He was indicted on Thursday, but the exact charges remain sealed. A grand jury was investigating his role in hush money payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. We're considering higher prices than we otherwise had. And yes, there is a scenario of $100 barrel oil, but I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. To get to $100 oil, we'd have to have significantly more oil taken out of the market and have a lot of uncertainty based on that oil taken out of the market. Edward Morse, absolutely brilliant this morning from Citigroup. Believe it or not, folks, he was pre-scheduled. Thanks for our team for getting out front of that huge OPEC Plus announcement. we gotta, we got to summarize this. John Farrow on assignment right now. Lisa Bramowitz, it's real simple. Um, here, let's summarize Ed Morse. 
He's not looking for a hundred dollar a barrel, mostly because the demand just isn't there, like the demand optimists would suggest. There are two aspects of this: demand Please. destruction, which we saw last <clears throat> summer when oil prices got uh, pretty high, and then just declining demand because of a declining economic backdrop. Two different features, and people will disagree over both of them. And you've seen that in the notes this morning. What we do on surveillance and what we've done for decades is try to get out front of a store and give you some depth on it. We do this at $85. Brent crude up 6.2%. West Texas Intermediate, $69 a barrel for a cup of coffee. Now above 80, 80.32 on American West Texas Intermediate. As we talk to Ed Morris about west and east of the Suez, we can look back. I can't believe I'm saying this, folks, but 40 years ago, you had to read Daniel Jurgen the Prize, and you had to read Robert Lacey in his iconic one volume, The Kingdom, on Saudi Arabia. All that's been redone and done better by Ellen Wald, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, in her absolutely definitive one volume, Saudi Inc. Ellen Wald joins us on short notice this morning. Ellen, you talk in your book about an Arabian dawn. If this is Riyadh and those around the Persian Gulf, is this OPEC Plus announcement a new Arabian dawn? It, it very well might be. Uh, what we're seeing, I think, is actually a, an unprecedented um, level of, of cooperation. I think I wrote uh, last night that OPEC Plus is now functioning like a well-oiled machine, uh, which we definitely hadn't seen before. I mean, these voluntary cuts were put together quite quickly. I mean, just last week we had ABS come out and say, no, we are sticking with uh, you know, our plans, we, we set these production quotas for the next six months. So this is this is what we're sticking with. We see the gyrations in the market as a financial issue and not something that a supply change could even impact. And now there's basically a complete reversal. Uh, I think there's definitely some kind of geopolitical right. posturing going on here, uh, without a doubt, especially given the uh, comments from uh, Russia's Alexander Novak. Well, Ellen, in, in the construct of morning television and radio, you and I are going to do this in 45 seconds. But simply, there are almost tribal rivalries around the Persian Gulf, whether it's Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, maybe alone, the, Unite, the five United Arab uh, Emirates as well. Are they all on the same page, or do they argue unless they bring out an OPEC Plus announcement? There's definitely always arguments going on, but I do think that we are seeing uh, the Gulf on the same page. It'd be interesting to see really where Iraq is falling in this. Uh, it does seem like Iraq really does want to produce and sell more oil, especially now that they've uh, gotten agreement with the uh, KRG in terms of oil exports. So it'll be interesting to see if Iraq really does uh, cut uh, its production or if it uh, continues to sell despite the OPEC plus agreement. What price does Saudi Arabia want for oil? Great question. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. I think most people think that they want 80 or slightly above. I think if it gets to 90 or above 90, they start getting jittery about demand, uh, particularly because China is a big customer. And if it's too high for China, they're just going to go buy more Russian oil or more Iranian oil at discount. How much do you view this as them trying to boost oil prices versus get ahead a decline in demand that they're already seeing and that they're getting tea leaves from, from voices over in Beijing? Yeah, I definitely think that they are very concerned about the potential for a recession to hit oil prices. Uh, think back to 2008. This is... Kind of that's, that's the touch point that they are going off of. They don't want to see a huge drop uh, kind of fall out of the market and then have to respond to that. They want to get out ahead of it. And so I'm absolutely sure that this is uh, this cut is in part an attempt to head that off. How do they mitigate the implication, at least by some, that this is kind of thumbing the nose over of Washington, D.C., which has been trying to go on the other side and lower energy prices? I'm not sure you can mitigate that uh, that statement because I'm sure that that is uh, a bit a uh, part of this. There's definitely been rising tensions uh, with the United States. I think that 
Um, you know, Saudi Arabia has a good point because its biggest customer now is Asia. It's not yeah. the U.S. The U.S. is not in the same position it used to be in in terms of the big customer. And I think that Saudi right. Arabia sees U.S., if you want to lower energy prices, you produce more oil. Well, I got like eight ways to go here. And this is where Ed Morris was on East of the Suez. Is there one price for oil or are we finally gotten to the point you know, within sense and within the microeconomics west and east of the Suez, there's two or three different oil prices. There's two or three or five or six or seven, uh, you know, if you really want to want to parse it out. I do think that um, while we do see these benchmark numbers, there are all different prices. We've got Saudi Arabia with long-term contracts in China at certain prices. They're selling it at a different price to Europe. They're selling it at a different price to the United States. And that's all part of their calculus now. Ellen, how much do you view this also as, frankly, running out of capacity to produce, or at least trying to limit how much uh, OPEC Plus produces now to save it for later? Really good point. And I've seen that that point raised uh, a bunch of times. I don't see that as a, as a big factor for Saudi Arabia. They've got the capacity. They're, they're coming online with more capacity. In fact, some of that capacity is even spoken for with these new deals with China, where they're going to, to be supplying another 600,000 barrels of oil a day to joint ventures right. that they've got in China. So I don't think they are concerned about capacity. Uh, I think they are concerned more about prices. And there are definitely other uh, OPEC plus countries that may be concerned about capacity. Ellen Wald, thank you so much for the Atlantic Council definitive there on Saudi Inc. Uh, th this morning. I learned a lot there. That was really informative. I would agree. There's also this idea that the U.S. doesn't have the same clout with Saudi Arabia that it once did uh, in yeah. any way because they're not the major <laughs> uh, consumer. I go to the Bloomberg Business Week article. Excuse me, folks. I'm fighting the plague that John gave me. <clears throat> I go. I, I go over the Bloomberg Business Week cover from like I'll say eight years ago of all the tankers off Singapore, like 70 boats off at the Straits of Malacca, and we forget that you got to move the stuff. And I've never heard someone say like Ellen Wall that all of a sudden it's not that the U.S. is alone. It's just its own discrete, different story. Versus coming out of the Persian Gulf, I think Stravitas told us it's 21 miles wide or something, going around India and then going all the way across whatever that ocean, is that the Indian Ocean there? Am I going <laughs> you're doing, okay? You're doing great, especially and with the arm ocean. You find a place between Indonesia and Singapore to go through to go up to China and... And to Japan, it's not a small issue. You know, Ellen Wald said something a couple of months ago. She said, if you want to get a sense of China's growth trajectory, take a look at the signal from Riyadh. Take a look at what Saudi Arabia does. Their cut, how much does that signal that the tea leaves that they have gotten from China is that growth is not sustainable there and that things are not recovering as quickly? And that really speaks to what a lot of people have been talking about with growth that is going to be disappointing from China, at least versus where people thought perhaps a year ago. Well, we're going to have to see on the data here, the first day of the second quarter. Let us start with oil. Lisa, help me here. West Texas Intermediate, 80.30. Brent crude, $85, rounded up, 6% move. I mean, it's not ginormous. It's technically not a big deal. I need 90, 91 before I get technical, but uh, that's a lift. Yeah, but that certainly was what uh, was giving some sentiment to markets. You're seeing an ongoing breakdown in NASDAQ futures at new session lows here, as you are seeing yields higher, down eight tenths of a percent. We're going to uh, we're going to continue to uh, push this conversation forward on the open. Sri Sankaran of Morgan Stanley, Kathleen Jones uh, will be joining us as well of Charles Schwab and Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo to bring that conversation really forward. Interesting to see what Harvey has to say. Really, really interesting to see how he's amended his Q2 view. It's be been a tough one to get right, and we're going to be catching up with him shortly. On radio, on television, stay with us. This is Bloomberg. <music> Bloomberg Surveillance, and we welcome Global Wall Street and all the rest of you on radio and television to what we're doing here, the first working day of a second quarter of 2023. It has been extraordinary so far this year. It feels like the whole year was in uh, uh, in three months with a banking crisis and such. But we move forward, and we move forward now in economics, finance, investment. I'm going to get right to it with Jobs Day coming up on Friday. ISM statistics today, all of it coming back down to Federal Reserve policy. And what is so important to understand 
And folks, this is out at the Arch of St. Louis on the Mississippi River. It's important when you are a St. Louis Cardinal and you're on injured reserve. So Adam Wainwright of the St. Louis Cardinals sang the Star Spangled Banner on opening day for the Cardinals, which clearly sets us up for next year. On opening day, Michael McKee, we expect James Bullard of the St. Louis Fed to sing opening day for the Cardinals. <laughs> well, I suppose I could make that my first question, Tom, to Jim Bullard. He is the president of the St. Louis Fed, and he joins us now. Uh, good morning, Jim. Good morning. Uh, Tom wants to know if you're going to sing the national anthem on opening day next I have, year. I have no plans uh, <laughs> to do that. Well, as uh, Roseanne Rosanna Dana used to say on uh, Saturday Night Live, it's always something. Uh, we were in the middle of a quote-unquote banking crisis, and now we've got another oil shock uh, this morning. Everybody waking up to headlines and say, maybe we go to $100. So as a Fed official, when you see that, how are you reacting? Well, on the financial stress, I think, uh, you know, this is a post-Dodd-Frank world, and I, I do think that the reaction to the banking problems uh, was swift and was appropriate. And uh, both here in the U.S. and uh, overseas, and uh, so I think you know the idea that there are macro prudential tools that you can use in that kind of situation to calm things down, that seems to have worked so far. You never know uh, if there's further things uh, happening, but if if there are, we can react with macro prudential tools again. Uh, and then on the policy, the monetary policy side, we can still proceed to. Uh, fight inflation and, and get inflation down during 2023 and 2024 uh, back to target. So I think, uh, you know, this idea that you can uh, walk and chew gum at the same time, you've got the macro prudential tools for uh, financial stress and you've got monetary policy to fight inflation and we can do both uh, as long as the financial stress doesn't uh, morph into something uh, much larger. And so far, so good. Uh, but knock on wood, uh, you're never sure what's going to be around the corner. But does $100 oil or the idea at least of this oil shock complicate your job? Yeah, well, of course, oil is always, uh, uh, the oil price is, is always important. Uh, I would have expected that somewhat higher oil prices anyway with China coming back uh, sooner than expected during the first half here of 2023 and with Europe skirting recession. Uh, so both of those, and strong data in the U.S., all of those are, are pretty uh, bullish factors, I would say, for the oil market. Um, this was a surprise, the OPEC decision, but whether it will have a lasting impact, I think, is an open question. Now, you had already moved up your estimate of where the Fed funds rate needed to be to bring down inflation. You were talking an effective rate of around 5.6 percent. Does this change that calculation at all? And can you explain why you think we need to go that high to uh, hit the terminal rate? Uh, I think we'll, we will need, I think we'll need to get over 5 percent. <clears throat> the committee says that, uh, the median person on the committee says, uh, a little over 5 percent. I'm a little higher than that. Um, I think inflation will be stickier. And, uh, you know, I'd look mostly at the core measures of inflation, like PCE core inflation, or the Dallas Fed trim mean, which really hasn't come down very much at all, is still in the 4 percent range. So, uh, you know, 4.6 or something like that. So, um, so we're still talking about a lot of inflation, more than double our inflation target on that basis. And uh, oil prices fluctuate around. It's hard, to, it's hard to track exactly. Some of that might feed into inflation and make our job a little bit more difficult. Just north of us this morning in Oak Brook, Illinois, McDonald's has told its corporate officials to stay home uh, this week because they're going to start notifying people that they're being laid off. How concerned are you uh, with all these headlines about layoffs coming in that you may go too far? Yeah, the labor market is super strong. Uh, still uh, many more job openings than there are un uh, unemployed workers. I think if a worker does get disrupted uh, today that they should, you know, let's hope and, and pray for them that they'll be able to uh, get a new job. But uh, it's still a very robust labor market with 3.8% uh, unemployment. Um, 
uh, you know, the Kansas City Fed's labor market conditions index still at a super high level. Uh, jobs reports have been very, very strong uh, in 2023 here. So you're really not seeing much ebbing uh, in the labor market. I think there are <clears throat> structural issues where uh, labor supply is running under labor demand, and, and that's going to take quite a while to, uh, to settle down. What are you expecting for Friday? The jobs report. <clears throat> uh, I, don't have an, I don't have a number for you, uh, but uh, anecdotal information seems to indicate that the firms are still scrambling for workers. They're doing some other things that are strategies that might slow this down a little bit. They're substituting capital for labor. That makes a lot of sense in this situation. Um, but uh, I just think that on the whole, uh, they still need workers. Well, if they still need workers and supply is running below demand, that has to complicate the idea of monetary policy because that's not what's supposed to happen when you're raising rates as much as you have. Uh, that's true, uh, although I'm not as oriented toward the Phillips curve as many, but um, uh, I think uh, the way I would state it is that the strong labor market gives us headroom to fight inflation. It's a good time to be fighting inflation and trying to get inflation back to target while the labor market is as strong as it is, and even workers that get disrupted uh, hopefully will be able to find a uh, new job and maybe a better job uh, in this situation. You have critics around the country and certainly on Capitol Hill that say workers are finally getting their share. Uh, wages are going up, not quite keeping up with inflation, but much better than they had been. And here comes the Fed, wants to squash them down again and cut the wage increases in order to bring down inflation. What do you say to uh, those people? Well, what are they talking about? Real wages have gone down for most people. So the inflation is hurting them. So. Inflation is hurting the average worker. So you don't think the Fed has a perception problem with America these days? You'd like to get rid of the inflation so that people can get their, uh, get a, a better uh, labor market outcome and be able to afford the goods that they have to purchase. So um, uh, I think there's been a lot of confusion around this issue. <clears throat> it's true that some, uh, some workers in some categories uh, got uh, more than the uh, in increase in wages that more than made up for inflation. But for many workers, that hasn't been the case. Uh, they've been lagging behind in real wages, and uh, that's why you'd like to bring inflation under control and get a better outcome for the labor market. Uh, markets have uh, been struggling this morning to figure out what's going to happen going forward with the oil price uh, headlines. But uh, going into this weekend, <clears throat> they were pricing four rate cuts uh, over the coming year. Why are you and Wall Street so far apart in what you say is likely to happen? They should listen to me. Uh, so the, uh, here's what I think. I think I put 80 percent probability that the financial stress will uh, decline and then make that your base, baseline uh, forecast. I think that's for low growth, but growth, a continued pretty strong labor market and inflation coming down, that's got 80% probability. Maybe now I'd go to 85% probability or something. And then the other branch uh, where financial stress gets worse, <clears throat> uh, then, uh, you know, then we'll have to bring out more macro prudential tools and it'll be a stressful situation. And all bets are off in that situation. The problem with Wall Street is they've got too much probability on that branch and not enough probability on the other branch. So I think they're going to reprice uh, to the uh, slow growth scenario. And so I think we'll see this change uh, in the weeks ahead here. Go back to the banks for a second. In February, uh, the staff at the uh, Open Market Committee presented on the idea of these asset mismatches on bank balance sheets. So you were kind of aware that this could be a problem. Was there something that the Fed missed or didn't do or should have done to keep these, uh, the, the bank situation, we'll call it, from developing as it has? I can't talk about what was presented at the FOMC meeting, uh, so I will neither confirm nor deny uh, that. Uh, but uh, my own staff here uh, was certainly well aware of uh, issues with banks. Uh, we talked to bankers uh, all the time. We're uh, a regulator of banks, and so we knew uh, that there were issues about, let's say, uh, some deposits running off uh, to 
um, non-bank uh, entities that wanted to pay a higher rate, uh, that's occurring. Uh, but I think at a rate that's certainly manageable, for at least for the banks that we talk to, um, they've got uh, some uh, securities holdings that have lost value uh, as interest rates have gone up, but that also I think is manageable for nearly all institutions. Um, so that you know they're running businesses and they've got challenges, but they've also they're also competitive, and they'll uh, they figure out ways to. Um, uh, manage the situation. I would also say anecdotally that uh, most banks say loan demand is is strong and they actually have incentives to make loans at the higher interest rates if they can uh, in order to offset some of the older loans that they have that are that are at lower interest rates. Well we got to send it back to Tom but <clears throat> given how Tom introduced us uh, you've got predictions for interest rates growth GDP the end of the year. Cardinals prediction? I'm sure it'll be a great year for the Cardinals. I think they'll win the division and uh, they'll do very well. Another victory yesterday, so excellent. <laughs> All right, Tom Keene, we'll send it back to you uh, and the folks in New York. Um, given the fact that uh, Jim Bullard is so optimistic about the Cardinals, we'll yes. take that as a good sign for the economy, we and hope. The, and we like the pitcher's clock as well. Michael McKee, thank you so much. We're getting back to N uh, National League Baseball here. James Bullard of the Fed. Our John Gittleson and Don Lim report here an update on the Blackstone Real Estate Income Trust. And they're talking about the liquidity, the redemptions as well that we're seeing. And to put this in scale, this trust was up 8% last year. I want to make clear, even with the withdrawal requests they're seeing, they're seeing some rent stability within the Blackstone Real Estate Income Trust. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. A surprising move from OPEC Plus as the coalition makes an oil production cut of more than 1 million barrels a day. Oil futures soared following the new inflation risk. Saudi Arabia led the cartel by pledging its own 500,000 barrel a day supply reduction. The White House said the cutbacks were ill-advised. That Chinese spy balloon that floated over the U.S. in February reportedly gathered intelligence from several military sites. According to NBC News, the intelligence that was collected mostly from electronic signals rather than images. The U.S. shot the balloon down off the coast of South Carolina. The debris that was recovered is still being analyzed. Extra Space Storage has agreed to buy Life Storage for $12.4 billion in an all-stock deal. And Life Storage operates more than 1,100 self-storage properties. Self-storage real estate benefited during the pandemic because people wanted more space while working from home. But demand and pricing power have begun to soften. And Bed Bath & Beyond has begun a three-week countdown to possible bankruptcy. The home goods retailer is trying to get another $300 million from equity markets that have largely turned against it. Shares plunged 50% after the company raised $360 million from a hedge fund. The deal diluted existing shareholders. An entertainment conglomerate, Endeavor, has agreed to power by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. We do think that credit conditions are going to tighten. At this point, it's difficult to gauge. If, if that does tighten, I think it certainly means hard landing is, is, is more, uh, more likely than even we were anticipating. Moment. Our view is still that it, this is a moderate recession. It looks a lot like the early 1990s. We've always thought it happens in the second half of this year and haven't really changed that view. I think it's consistent with what we're seeing. Just brilliant on Friday. Matthew Lozzetti joining us, chief U.S. economist of Deutsche Bank, and arguably for me in market economics, the call of 2022, they came out and said recession, but they were heated when they had the courage to make that early call that it would be delayed. And a lot of other people got on the gloom bandwagon, and Deutsche Bank, in hindsight, looks really, really sharp about saying we're not there yet to some form of economic uh, slow down. We welcome all of you on Bloomberg Surveillance. John Farrell on an assignment coming back from the Australian Grand Prix and Lisa Bramow. It's getting ready for the nine o'clock hour as well. Uh, red and green on the screen. I've got 
you know, I don't know what to make of it. NASDAQ pulls back a little here. First day of trading, the VIX 19.64. Two-year yield gets out. What's elevated now? I stand corrected up 10 basis points, 4.12%. Getting out front of key ISM data at 10 a.m. Please stay with us on radio and television. That'll be the first good data of the month. I never follow it, but Farrow tells me it's an actual uh, big deal. Right now, the big deal is to speak with John Writing. He's a chief economic advisor at Breen Capital, and there's any number of ways to go here to go here. John, I want to talk with James Bullard of St. Louis. I'm going to say you have been in the camp with Bullard looking for some form of not sustained inflation, but the inflation worry uh, won't go away. Bullard making clear we're putting too much focus on the banking crisis and not enough on monetary policy 101. Do you agree? Um, I do agree. Um, I think it's very important to you know, this realize that the U.S. is a uh, very strong uh, capital markets and banking system, and it's a very different situation than back in uh, 2007, 2008, uh, and the financial crisis that took down Bear Stearns, uh, Lehman Brothers, um, AIG. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very different world. So uh, I, I think there is too much focus on that. The, the responses have been very swift, very strong. We can argue what the <coughs> origins of this is, but we do know that, um, um, in, in effect, there's an implicit guarantee of all deposits, regardless of deposit insurance. There's some reform that needs to be considered later, but, but that was essentially what Powell uh, promised mm -hmm. at the uh, last uh, pre uh, FOMC press conference. We're going to rip up the script here with John Writing, who lived the Bear Stearns crisis. I would say one of the great themes right now, John, is that James Diamond standing out front of your Bear Stearns headquarters on that tumultuous day, his hindsight is he made a massive mistake. Are we repeating the, the foibles of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, or have we learned our lessons over 15 years? Well, I think we've learned some lessons. There's no doubt about it that the uh, higher capital levels, the stress tests have done a lot to strengthen the underlying banking system. But you have to have significant questions about how that was implemented by supervisors. Because if you look at the case of Silicon Valley Bank, they had over $15 billion of losses in their held to maturity portfolio, which doesn't get run through the P&L statement, doesn't get scored against their mm -hmm. capital. So they had almost all of their capital, <clears throat> the size of their capital was mm -hmm. almost the same magnitude as the size of their losses right. in the held to maturity portfolio. Now you can only hold something to maturity if you have the funding to hold things to maturity. And that's where there is a similarity to 2008, which, and, and in many ways, what happened there was so much faster. Um, right. And, and, but, but we know how to fix bank right. runs. Deposit insurance <clears throat> uh, fixes bank runs, and, and we've had that, and we've had some stabilization in the situation there. And the banking system as a whole looks very different in right. terms of the size of their held to maturity losses against their overall capital. I want to get back on script here because the time is so important. Folks, if you're just joining us on radio, John Riding and Breen Capital with us this morning. And, and John, I've got to dovetail two themes this weekend. One was Adam Tooze's phenomenal essay in the FT alluding to the delusion or the imagery, the illusion that nominal GDP gives us. You've written about this for years, and I pull it over to Dominic Constum, ex Credit Suisse, now at Mizuho, and the idea of we've got an odd nominal GDP because inflation is set high. We have a certain form of restriction, and then the Constum's phrase, are we super restrictive right now? All the dynamics that are going on, does Powell have a restriction he didn't expect? Well, let's start with one definition of restrictive, which is do we have restricted monetary policy? And, and I don't think that you know the Fed's seeking that sufficiently restrictive level of policy. Uh, I, I don't think they're there yet. I mean, Jim Bullard made Bullard clear, rightly, yeah. rightly <clears throat> pointed out that the underlying inflation rate is in the fours, and he cited the, the Dallas Fed or all, all the other measures mm -hmm. pretty firmly in, in the mid-4%, which means that interest rates, the policy rate adjusted for inflation, has only 
barely turned positive. Now, there is a question, how much does a credit tightening have an impact here? Uh, and does that substitute for additional rate hikes? But Jim also said that loan demand has been strong. So you know, we have to see how that plays out. But when I said we, you know, the U.S. is these twin markets where the, if the banking system has issues, there's still the capital markets. In many ways, this is the reverse of the long-term capital episode uh, back in 1998 where the capital markets froze up. And the banking system was there to lend. So we do have to remember that there are big banks as well as small banks. The big banks will get bigger out of this as they did out of the last right. financial crisis. <clears throat> They'll be, I think, willing to lend, willing to take market share. And then there's also the capital market. So you know, let's look at things like the NFIB survey and see if the availability of, of credit becomes right. uh, a, a constraining issue on businesses. It hasn't been uh, up until this point, I mean, a, a major concern for them. We don't have to turn this into a history lesson. I, Steve Leisman with a great essay. Uh, he's over at the Death Star. Steve Leisman with a great essay years ago on neo vixellian theory. And we don't need to go back to 1910, 1920 theory. But what we have here is a whole body of people, John, who've never lived in a normalized interest rate environment. I want you to speak to our audience on radio and television that have never lived, oh, that's the way the yield curve should look, oh, we're going to get out to the oddity of, of a normal rate environment. What's it going to be like? You know, it's very funny referring to Steve Leesman's essay because that came out of a conversation that I had with Steve, and we were talking about Vixel before it became popularized, um, the, this concept of a natural rate of interest. Now, the Fed has argued, coming out of work from John Williams for a long time, that that natural interest rate of interest has been depressed and became very low. Now, Olivia Harry Blanchard Summers says that, yeah. Secular stagnation. Yet if you look now in the markets, the markets are saying real interest rates are going to be positive at a significant level for the next decade. We got as high as 1.7%. That was maybe a bit high. We were around one and a quarter percent at the end of last week. So if you have a real rate of one and a quarter percent and you got to get inflation down, but right now you, you're talking inflation running at un underlying terms yeah. at 4.5%. Where does that long-term rate of interest belong? Right now the Fed still... Where does it belong? We're going to run out of time. This is critical. Ken Rogoff's in the camp with you versus what Olivier's saying. We're going to talk to Olivier Blanchard at the IMF meetings here uh, in 10 days or so. With that said, where is your new 2% level? Does it have to be elevated higher, as Adam Posen says? Well, well I think the Fed has to raise its long-term neutral rate of interest from half a percent adjusted for inflation to something more like one, one and a quarter mm -hmm. percent, where the markets are. Uh, I, I would say that the, as a long-term interest rate, allowing for inflation uncertainty, probably should be thinking 4%. You're at 4%? Anchor for the 10-year. Mm. Um, uh, and, and probably uh, uh, for the funds rate going forward. This idea that 2.5% is our long-run neutral rate of interest, right. um, I, I think it is an outdated concept. Okay, John writing uh, with us today, really spirited conversation. There's just a window over the fund we're going to have over the next uh, two weeks. John, Lisa, and I... Thrilled to inform you of our conversations at the meetings of the International Monetary Fund. We're lining up all sorts of uh, guests on this, not only in Washington, but really worldwide uh, as well. The team is working on that spirited conversation. Just a window that you got here from uh, Mr. Writing. John Writing is with Breen Capital. Tomorrow, oh, excuse me, this morning, coming up on Bloomberg Television at 1030, Amrita Sen, I'm, I'm going to tune into this. This is going to be important. Amrita Sen here on the OPEC Plus announcement, the dynamics that you saw. Thanks to our team working all day Sunday and into today to work on that OPEC Plus story. Red and green on the screen, SPX down five. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.